Welcome back, guys. I am so excited to be back in the studio today. Uh, we've got an incredible, incredible guest. Sterling Cooper is an award-winning Australian adult star turned sex coach, and he aims to undo the damage done by modern society, aims to teach men to embrace their masculinity and live a life more true to their nature. Please welcome Mr. Sterling Cooper to the program. How you doing, Sterling? I'm fantastic, mate. It's great to finally meet you. Yeah, it's great to meet you too, man. We had a lot of friends in common, yes. uh, and you wrote me, and then uh, and I was just like, it was really one of the craziest things, right? Because, and we'll get into this a little bit. Uh, I got a message from from Andrew Tate. Uh, Andrew then connects me. We, we go back and forth about doing an interview. He was because initially he was going to come to the states. Yeah. We, I was going to set him up here in Vegas. Then things happened. Obviously, he wasn't able to do that. Then he said, "Hey, you got to interview my friend Justin." And I watched the Justin. And I was like, "Oh man, I get along with this dude. I'm from Texas. He's from Louisiana. It's perfect." And me and Justin have become very good friends since then. So Justin has me here. Then Justin goes and does an interview with Rollo. And he, he shows Rollo the interview, and then Rollo and I decide to start a fucking show together. So nice. we're doing it. You and I are doing a show with Rollo Tomasi to med together, but it all starts because of that whole situation. Um, now, going into that, uh, it, it is kind of strange because one of the things is you're uh, you know, an adult a film star that you, you talk about your, your sex coach, but one of the things you do say is that men can get addicted to porn. This Absolutely. is one of, the, one, of the, one of the most inception type things that I've ever heard of. <laughs> and one of the things that I enjoyed, we had uh, orangutan on here a couple weeks ago, fantastic photographer from, from Miami, and he says, it's not about the porn, it's about the doses. And then we also, uh, Andrew Huberman did a thing where he talked about when men watch too much pornography, it causes a reset of their dopamine spike. So their Very dopamine good. spike is always at 10, and they can't, uh, a couple of problems, they, don't, they aren't able to deal with women normally because of it. The, everything pales in comparison because of the dopamine spike. And then it also uh, creates a situation where their normal partner doesn't fulfill their fantasies like the pornography does. Can you go into that? Absolutely, man. And that's, that's one of the biggest problems that I see, especially with younger guys who come to me looking for help. It's so consistent where they have this problem of a, a lot. It's, older guys would find this problem kind of funny because most of the older gentlemen who come to me have the problem of they can't last long enough yeah. in the bedroom. Whereas with younger dudes, a lot of their problems is, well, they can't even get hard to start with and they can't eject, they can't finish at all with a girl. So, so they, they aren't even getting hard because of the fact that they've watched too much porn. Yeah, it's, it's exactly what Andrew Huberman says. It's yeah. like, a, it's, they're bombarding their dopamine receptors yeah. with so much novelty yeah. from all this different porno pornographic material that when they eventually get a beautiful woman in front of them, well, she on her own is not stimulating enough for their brain. Yeah, it's one, one of the issues, uh, and I don't know how old you are, but I'm, I'm 45, and we used to have a box of dirty magazines that we hid out in the forest. It was me and some of the other neighborhood kids. And when I say dirty mag magazines, I mean Fredericks of Hollywood, uh, I mean, Victoria's Secret. That was about as dirty as it got. And we would go out there and look at, we weren't even jerking off. We were just looking at the magazines. That was, yeah. and we had to work hard and we hid that from our parents. Right. And our Boy Scout, <laughs> our Boy Scout uh, troop leader, we hid the fucking stuff out in the forest. And then uh, today you have a 10 year old looking at Bukaki stuff because he's like, are you 18? Click yes. And then that's yeah. it. And it's, it's really crazy because it is a very different, different type of situation yep. uh, where they, you know, I can see how, and by the way, we're going to talk about this artificial intelligence, what that could do in this whole industry to make things worse, not better. Mm. But it does desensitize you to that type of situation where you deal with normal women. And it was, uh, it, I'll tell you something else that, that's kind of interesting, is that you, when you come to Los Angeles, go to Miami or go to Las Vegas, people will tell you that what you see on porn is unrealistic. And then you come here and it's like, no, it's not, not that unrealistic. It's actually pretty realistic. But at, at the same time, you're meeting people in real life versus watching it online. When I went to the AVN Awards, I just saw guys like waiting in lines, like holding bouquets of flowers to give to their favorite porn star. And it was just mind blowing to me. Bro, the, my first time I went to AVN, that, to me, it wasn't, it wasn't even the bouquets of flowers. Yeah. It was dudes lining up with like DVDs. Of their of like their favorite chicks yeah. gangbang or whatever yeah. and like waiting for her to sign it and I'm sitting in the booth next to her I'm like this is I I would never have expected this yeah in a million years like a grown ass man sitting there waiting like 20 30 minutes to get like a Bukake like, DVD this something. this may have been a traumatic experience she did for money to get through college and you're bringing her evidence of this thing that she did it's just, yeah you're exactly <laughs> right man yeah but do I. Are, Thinking back as well, I had the exact same kind of experience with like Dirty Mags was like, 
our old news agent used to dump like the dirty ma used dirty magazines at the tip at the, like the local what do you got called like uh, the dump. trash dump yeah yeah the, yeah, yeah, yeah. The landfill the, yeah, landfill. the landfill yeah and me and my buddies we used to go to the, we knew exactly where they dumped them we'd go to the landfill go to the one spot we'd all grab like a copy of whatever that thing was yeah for those of you who are under the age of like 30 who has sat there and been have high speed porn for your whole life going to a fucking landfill to look for dirty magazines. <laughs> That's what it was like back in the day, for sure. Bro, that, and that was the unique experience. And I, I remember when we finally got like internet. I'm, I'm from like a yeah. butt fuck nowhere. Oh, bro, we had ethernet at fucking UT Austin. I lost my bro. mind. Yeah. Like my, my, so my brother, he's a lot older than me. He got the internet and then he got like, my first exposure to pornography was like sitting on his computer and like scroll, finding like, the the random folder that was labeled something funny yeah and it was a bunch of shit I'm like what the hell is this and it, but thinking it now that is on every like teenager's phone instantly bro it was a two megabyte photo that took 30 seconds to load yes the, the patience you had to have to fap back in the <laughs> oh day oh my god bro. Sitting, wait for the titty <laughs> you'd see the eyes you'd get down to like here like oh nipples coming nipples coming up uh, bam that it's but now it's instantaneous and you get anything you want it's crazy it's like we're telling war stories about how we used to watch <laughs> porn 35 years ago it's so crazy man you don't yeah. really you you kids don't realize the struggle you know said how hard it was <laughs> no i'll tell you what else i mean i didn't i didn't intend to go in this direction but like jenna jameson it was stunning like if you saw her in person, she was Chasey, uh, Chasey Lane was stunning. Like these girls today would not probably have done porn. They would have been Instagram models and they would maybe had had an OnlyFans or whatever. Yeah. But like back then, because there was no Instagram and because you did, say, let's say you did Playboy, after you did Playboy, there was no way for you to really monetize on what you were doing. There was no reality TV shows yeah. back then. And so a lot of these girls, like, a lot prettier girls were doing, or the prettiest girls were doing porn back then. Like, I think if you go back and look at 90s porn stars, a lot of those girls could have been classical models. Whereas today, you have this massive variety. You were talking about it on an interview you were doing where the BBW women were actually making more money. You were, uh, what was it? Uh, Tristan Tate was sitting there talking about unique women who had uh, different sexual preferences or trans were making more money because there were just so many, so fewer of them. Yeah. And what an interesting, like how crazy and how, what the spectrum was. Whereas when I was growing up, it was Jenna Jameson and then in in, in real life, it was Pamela Anderson. Those were the hottest women to me. Do you understand? It was like it was like Carmel Electra. Those were the hottest women. And then now it's just this huge spectrum of of different things people are into. People want to realize like how deep the talent pool is yeah. in adult entertainment when it comes to women. And to give you an idea of like the comparisons, like the number of dudes that are actively shooting in America, right, in the industry between like you know L.A., Vegas, Miami. You're probably looking at a ta male talent pool of less than fifty dudes, okay, and a female talent pool in like a, of like a thousand. Yeah, like that is insane. It's like it's really the same twenty dudes banging all these chicks again yeah. and again and again and again and again. And it's like there's a re and the reason for that is like most guys can't do the job. Yeah, for a start. it's an incredibly difficult job mm -hmm. to do, and every dude on the planet thinks he can do it, right? And would love to have a crack at it, but they really can't. And it's Going back to your point, like th there's just this such a spectrum of, of, of women that it's just, you know, in a way, it's they're all, they're so similar to one another. Like, and I go out, you know, in in Miami or I go out in Vegas, and I look at the women on if I'm you know on Bumble or Tinder or something, or I'm on Instagram, and I'm like, is is it just me, or do all these girls now look the same? Yeah, so this it's is like an, the, Ka the Kardashianification of women. So let's talk about this. The science behind this, this evolutionary psychology podcast. So what some psychology students will do, you'll see a psychology 101 course. If you guys have ever experienced this, write it, write it in the chat. What they'll do is they'll take the, the photo, the student ID photo from everyone in the class, and they will overlay the photos on top of each other, and they will come up with one central, one unified composite of one face. And what they find is that one face, which is the average of all the faces in the class, is more attractive than any individual person in the, in the class. This goes back to the idea that what we find attractive is symmetry. This is the reason why, ready for it, face app is so prevalent. If you guys have seen FaceApp, it doesn't know anything about your ethnicity, it knows your gender, that's it. And it's able to make you look like a better version of yourself. How is that possible? How is Lenza making these anime versions of yourself that look so good? The reason why is because, and this is gonna be very offensive to a lot of people, beauty is not, physical beauty, is not subjective, it is objective. I have been throwing, I, I threw my 47th bikini competition um, this last summer. 
uh, whenever we have the men out there and they go out and they, they list their top 10, it's always the same girls. Right. It's never, and I know this is really hard for a lot of women to believe. I'm not saying that you don't have value as a human because you might be overweight or because you may be, you know, have a different facial structure. That doesn't mean you're not attractive or you don't have self-worth. But objective beauty is, it, uh, beauty is objective. And there are studies that show that beauty is objective. There's even studies that show that infants that are, they can't even speak. They stare more at physically attractive faces, faces that show signs of youth and facial symmetry. Well, what happened is, if you'll notice, it's not just that they have the same face as the Kardashians. The Kardashians all have the same face. Yeah. And you'll notice that Kylie is getting to look more and more. If you were to look at a black and white photo of Kylie where you couldn't tell like, like detail or pores or anything, and then you looked at Kim, you, you're getting to the point where you can't tell them apart. Then if you take the eye color out and the hair color and you put... Uh, Paris Hilton next to, to Kim. Now you can't tell them apart. And you start to see there's this one doctor in, uh, I want to say in um, Istanbul who does, uh, who does noses. And all my friends, they went out there and they came back with all, they, ha they all have the same nose. They all have Kim Kardashian. It's bonkers. But, but, but if beauty is objective, they're all going for the same thing. And what you're going to get is a lot of similarity. The reason why from an evolutionary standpoint is that there is no part of the homo sapien that re reveals more genetic code than the face. The face gives you more. Does that make sense? Mm. As men, we wear t-shirts. You can kind of tell how tall we are. There's the, these kind of things. But the symmetry, like how far away our eyes are from each other, whether or not there's um, a, asymmetry in the whole situation, the shape of our skull, whether or not there was some kind of damage. And here's another thing. When women have long hair in an ancestral period, so we're talking about the Pleistocene epoch or uh, periods like that 50,000 years ago, a woman with long hair down to her butt, that is a, that is a medical report. I can see that this woman has been healthy for over three years. Does right. that make sense? Yeah. So the likelihood she has not, she hasn't had parasites, the likelihood of her being able to carry children, that's, that's one of the things that you can tell from that. And if you ever look at a woman who has fake hair from behind, you cannot tell how old she is. Do, this, do that experiment. You cannot tell how old a woman is from behind if, you, if she has fake hair. So it's all these really strange evolutionary things. One of the reasons why I, I'm very interested, I always go to AVN, is because I believe it's almost like this Petri dish for evolutionary psychology. I'm friends with Satoshi Kanazawa. He's the guy who wrote uh, Why Beautiful People Have More Daughters. And I told him, I was like, Las Vegas is the ultimate expression of evolutionary psychology. It's the girls with the biggest boobs and the blondest hair versus the guys with the most money and the most Lambos. And they're going to war with each other to see who's going to win, right? No, more, normally, evolutionary psychology is, it's John who's the quarterback on the football team trying to date the head cheerleader. This is like that on, this is the nuclear war level of evolutionary psychology here in Las Vegas. So I thought that was a really interesting, um, really interesting thing you talked about. Uh, going back to what you said before, um, Initially, I was curious about this whole concept, which is the idea of you know the, what Lana Rhodes, Mia Khalifa, Riley Reid said after they left the industry. Yeah. Uh, it's just it's very interesting to me. I, I'm not. Gonna, I've talked about it previously before. What is it that you think when they left? What is the narrative that you believe is actually going on there? Okay, so like Mia Khalifa is an interesting one because Mia Khalifa constantly. I think honestly, Mia Khalifa is one of the best marketers on the planet. Yes, because Mia Khalifa, what she does every couple of years. She'll go out on Twitter or something and be like, oh, the industry exploited me. It was a terrible experience. Woe is me. And then she'll get absolutely every single current performing female in the industry retweeting her, boosting her signal. Yeah. And she just does this on repeat every two years. And so for, I think Mia Khalifa is actually a lot smarter than people give her credit for. Uh, if she genuinely had a problem with the adult industry, she wouldn't have an OnlyFans and she wouldn't keep using her stage name. Yeah. The, now, with the other two girls, they get to this point where what you might call the uh, you know, epiphany phase, they wanna, they're cranking out some kids, and they're starting to realize, oh, well, this is probably going to have an, a net negative impact on my kid when they eventually get into high school or whatever. And I don't want to pay for this, and therefore I'm going to complain about the world that I live in. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sit there and pretend like this wasn't a, com a decision of my own making that you know, in some way, shape, or form, this was bad for me. But your entire net worth is based around the fact that you did this. Yeah. You know, and I, I like, I'll sit there and I'll, I'll, I'll tell guys, you know, if you have a problem in the bedroom, you shouldn't watch pornography. Yeah. I'll, I'll openly say That's that. That's what to you guys. said before. The first thing, if a guy is having trouble in the bedroom, the first thing you recommend is that they stop watching porn. Absolutely. Yeah. 100%. First thing I'll say that. And, and, and people will come at me sometimes and be like, oh, isn't that a bit hypocritical because you shot it? I'm like, man, like, <laughs> You don't have, I'm not putting a gun to your head and making you watch porn. Right. Like, I, I had fun doing that. I, I'm, and I'm not going to sit there and pretend like the industry was, was 
bad t- for me or, or it was a neg- net negative for me. Like I had a great time. You said something funny. You said nobody's putting your gun to your head telling you to jerk off. Yeah. Although, although that would be a new s- subcategory of porn if they were. <laughs> That'd be like a very interesting. As soon as you said that, I was like, hey, would that be like a new tab that you put up at the top of browsers? Anyway, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> I would invent something here, Michael. Yeah. But yeah, like, like it's there's there's a this idea of personal responsibility. Like it just seems to be missing a lot these days. Let, let's I get see people complain. I see a lot of people like sort of trying to just get rid of this idea that they had any control over their life. Yeah, and but, I can't accept that narrative. So let, let's get into this specifically with Mia Khalifa. She and uh, she implies that she was pimped out by her boyfriend, and that she doesn't. She vaguely remembers any of the experience that she, what she was doing during the time because she was drugged up the whole time. If that truly was her experience, I feel bad for her. I totally understand why that would be an issue, and I get that. And by the way, I'm not negating that their experience is not their own. I'm sure that their experience, if. if if Lana Rhodes truly believes that she was taken advantage of, she has the right to have that belief. However, the problem is, what, what I'm curious is, from your standpoint, do you find the, the Hugh Hefner documentary comes out? Tons of playmates come out and say, like, this was not my experience. I enjoyed being with Hugh Hefner. Yeah. The vast majority of, have said that, okay? Still controversial. Have you found, after Lana Rhodes and Mia Khalifa and Riley Reid have said what they've said, have you found that, they, that the majority of adult actresses are agreeing with them? No. Yeah, they're not. No, absolutely not. Like, especially if they're act- if they're currently working. I just spoke to Bridget B. seventy two hours ago, and she said the same thing. She said, "Absolutely, I don't agree with what what she was saying." Bridget B. is amazing. I love yeah. Bridget, by the way. But they all the girls who are currently working. Basically, they love, they they enjoy the industry. They keep shooting. They totally do. It. That's why they do it. Like, no one is there's a, human trafficking. Like this idea of trafficking very, often gets conflated with the professional adult industry. Oh, we're gonna get into that. In a and they're yeah. so separate. Like. People are get into adult of their own free will, and they, they do it on purpose. And and I know, like all the agents in LA, these guys aren't out there recruiting. They they're in their emails are full of young women hitting them up every day trying to break into the industry. So the model has changed now, whereas before you were getting paid. Remember, I go back to when I was talking about Chasey Lane and Jenna Jameson. These girls were signing multi-million dollar contracts with individual studios. Yep. That doesn't happen as much anymore. There's probably very few girls that do that now. What has happened is now, studio porn is now a lead gen for OnlyFans. Right? Even for Karen Lee it is. It's a lead gen so that they can get back to their own porn where they're now making 80% of the profit, whereas they're making very little. Uh, we had Anna, uh, Amanda Nicole on here. She's got like 10 million followers on Instagram. She only films with her boyfriend. And then what happened was she did one scene for Brazzers as lead generation to go back to her OnlyFans. That's how the model has changed. And totally. that's why there's so many girls that are trying to jump in it from that standpoint now. Yeah, and I've, I've talked to like some new girls in the industry when, I'm, when, I'm, when I was actively shooting a lot more. And... I would tell them that exact same thing. I'd be like, okay, look, you, you have a choice here. It's like, you can shoot professional pornography consistently and kind of, I want to say, like, make yourself a little bit uh, less scarce, mm-hmm. right? Or you could do like one or two scenes for like a like one scene for Brazzers or something, mm-hmm. or maybe one for Evil Angel. Yeah. Really blow up your signal and then shoot for them never again. And all of that audience has to come to your OnlyFans for the rest of eternity to yeah. get to see you naked, basically. And it's, 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 and we, we are, I got into porn in this really interesting period just, bef- just before OnlyFans. Right. But also after Pornhub. Yeah. That was like the, the, the dry period. B- Pornhub meaning when the, there was so much free pornography out there that the margins in porn were being dried up, basically. Yeah, basically. Yeah. So prior to Pornhub, like the act, like the actors and actresses were getting paid like at least 4x. Yeah, what they were during like the the you know twenty fifteen yeah. onwards, right? And now, okay, they're still getting paid the same for like a day shoot with yeah. Brazzers or something. But now they also have the OnlyFans stuff on the back end, so they can make their own cut infinitely more than they ever used to be able to, like ten years ago. Yeah, so it's insane. Like the amount the amount of money that the individual adult pornographer can make off their own personal brand now is absolutely crazy. Yeah. It definitely is. And uh, the other thing, going back to what we were saying before, uh, the situation with Lana Rhodes and Mia Khalifa and Riley Reid, um, what, one of the things that I found difficult was, and this is what I, I, I generally have a problem with, it's if, that, if their problem, if their situation or if their experience was negative, I get that. It's when people start speaking for other people's experience. And what I mean by that is when Mia Khalifa comes out and says that any man who wants to date a, a younger woman is is somehow lacking and i'm like yeah he's lacking a younger woman bro like that's what he's lacking 
you know, it's just, it was one of these crazy things. And because here's the problem, You're, we talk about this in finance. I, I originally come from finance. We talk about talking your book. Elon Musk is a great example of talking your book. Elon Musk will say something positive about uh, Twitter or say something positive about um, Tesla, but that's because he owns Tesla. Tesla's in his book, it's in his portfolio. Right. With Mia Khalifa, when she says, as an, uh, like, men don't like these older women, we like, they like younger women and therefore they're insecure. What is she doing? She's talking her book. She's not who she was when she did the initial pornography. She's older now. And so maybe the cognitive bias hasn't reached her. Maybe she legitimately doesn't even understand that this is where some of this comes from. But the idea of, of younger women, the, the problem is I'm not going out searching for younger women. They're just attracted to me because I'm a, an established 45 year old US, former US military officer. Mm -hmm. They would rather be with me because of the security that it, it gleans them. It is not a function of me like, go, I don't have to go out and look for them. So, that, so for her to then intimate that I'm lacking something, it's just, it's so insulting. She doesn't know me or my life. And then, and then conversely, I'm supposed to believe her experience is valid, but mine isn't. Yeah. You see, you see what I'm point, my point? This is the issue that I'm having. It's like always people talk about free speech, let's all be friends, peace, love, and joy, positive energy, until you don't agree with them. <laughs> until you don't agree with them. Then there's a fucking problem with what they're saying. The, the same situation with Lana Rhodes saying that pornography should be banned, like should, should just be completely made illegal. And my whole problem, problem is there are studies that show, now they're controvertible, that's, that you have less domestic violence, and actually, men cheat less when they're mm -hmm. when there's a, in a society where there's pornography, right? Uh, if you see, like, uh, yeah, man, I'm going to call some people out here, but uh, I'm, certain Middle Eastern countries where pornography is not allowed, you see rampant prostitution. You don't see it as much in other places. There's not nearly as much prostitution in certain cities in the Middle East. I'm not going to say which ones, uh, as there is in Dallas, Texas. Dallas, Texas does not have anywhere near the same level of prostitution, but they have more, they have porn in strip clubs. Yeah. So it's just kind of one of these interesting things. What do you think about that? About about them, especially the the Mia Khalifa thing, specifically saying younger women. Lana Rhodes saying porn should be illegal. Yeah, I mean, like the Mia that, that I've seen that Mia, that Mia Khalifa yeah. tweet where she was you know trying to shame older dudes, and it's like you you can't shame away biology. Yes. You know, and honey, there's a reason you you were booked when you were young, like, yeah. you know, you're an 18 to 22 year old chick, like that got you your first gigs that, yeah. And that's the same for every girl who gets in the industry at a young age. It's like it, we're biologically programmed to want a fertile woman. Simple as that. And it's like, now you, you, you I don't know. I don't know if she's if deliberately, you know, being, uh, you know, not genuine or she's deliberately kind of being delusional about no here's what, what I, here's, here's what i think's happening they got through, through doing it and they're like gosh i did this and i now i'm casting this part of my life aside and as they go through life they keep meeting men who are not trying to date this pretty girl lana rhodes is still a very beautiful woman they they're not but they're not i you know I happen to know one of lana's exes uh very popular very prominent relationship that she was in and i personally believe he was dating lana rhodes the porn star and she was trying to have a long-term relationship right. with a guy who well, to be fair, was a cloud. It was a cloud jacking for both sides. Makes sense. Logan Paul's co-host. Uh, you, you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Like <laughs> it, it was just one of the. You you see what I'm saying? Like yeah. it was one of these things. Like this porn was so bad, and then she continues to cloud jack. And I'm like, I don't understand how you expect. And then the NFT thing. God damn, bro. She sits there, creates an NFT, and then when people are mean to her, she decides to take the money and run. So now there's no integrity in her dealing with her financially, but yet I'm supposed to believe her experience when it comes to how she experienced porn. And it leads me to believe, and I don't know this to be true, but it, it would lend someone to believe maybe she did enjoy doing porn while she was doing it. And now that she has to reap the repercussions of what she did, now she is retroactively going back and crying foul. Yeah. In order, and, and, and every, shot, every time she does it, she gets to put this vet, blanket of victimhood around her, which gives her more power. It gives her more armor in order to say what she wants to say. And it becomes more and more problematic when she says these kind of things. Because again, I don't want to disrespect the idea. If she legitimately feels like she was extorted, that's her opinion to believe that. My point is, it, de it definitely feels like now because you're older and you go to the PTA meetings and all the other ladies are staring at you, <laughs> right? And you start dating these men who are super good looking, high status, but realize they're just using you for sex and don't have any intention of being in a long-term relationship with you because of what you did previously. Now you're like, I'm having to pay consequences for something that I don't feel is my fault when it might actually be your fault. That's what it feels yeah. like to me. And they'll, they'll always have this horde of like white knight of course. fans on their Twitter accounts, of course. for example, like especially Twitter, where their whole career 
anything, they can do no wrong. Like any opinion they've ever put out, anything they've ever said publicly on Twitter, they've always had this massive throng of dudes who, oh, yes, my queen, yes, dear. Yeah. That, like completely agree with everything they said. So there's just no consequence for having a delusional opinion yeah. their entire life. And so even though they get, you know, they might get a bit older, their opinion changes. They'll still like they'll they'll shame guys for wanting to date younger women, and they'll still have this throng of or shame guys for watching porn. Yeah. What the fuck? And the, that's and what I'm talking these, about. All these dudes will, will just agree with her. Yes, at, by default, by the fact that she has a pair of tits. Yeah, and but that, but but when reality hits, and yeah. she actually has to find a man to settle down or an NFT to actually create value, <laughs> then all of a sudden, wham! The, then reality hits, then it doesn't it doesn't end up being the same way. And I think that that's kind of like the curse that a lot of girls in the adult industry have. Yeah is that they don't have to face reality, like the harsh reality of the world until they leave the industry. Yes. Especially if they get in at like 18 or like, you know, 20, something like that. Think of like the, the narcissism that, you know, I'm not trying to like shit on, on girls in the industry, but just think of the narcissism that would breed in a young woman if every single man you interact with on a daily basis, right? All your fans on social media, uh, every dude you meet on set, like the director, the co-star, the, 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 the makeup lady, the, the, the lighting guy, everybody is kissing your ass and trying, to, and trying not to upset you, right? Especially on set, because as the co-star, right? If I piss her off, bam, that no one's getting paid today. For sure. Right? So I can't piss her off. I'm walking on like, you know, eggshells. The director's doing the same. The lighting guy's doing the same. The audio guy's doing the same. And even if she is a raging pain in the ass on set, being super disrespectful, rocking up late, not knowing her lines, being unprofessional, we're all still walking on eggshells, treating her like a princess because we all know that our paycheck is dependent upon that girl walking onto the couch. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we had Carlotta Champagne on here. She, was, she just does uh, nude modeling. She's a figure model. She was in Playboy for a while. And she had a girl come up to her and say, hey, I was thinking about doing OnlyFans for extra money. And Carlotta said to her, no, when you do this, you need to be all in because this is going to change your life and it's going to affect you forever. Yep. Please understand, now, you and I both have f female friends that are uh, adult film actresses. I, no shame. I, I will go to their wedding. I hope to be at their baby shower. They're, they're, I, I think they're wonderful people. My whole thing is I would have had so much respect. One of the things really cool about Mia Khalifa is that, I don't know if you saw this, but the, there was a Nobel Prize winning chemist from, female chemist from, um, uh, she's from uh, Beirut, Lebanon. And she was retweeting Mia Khalifa. And she got hounded for that. You know, Mia Khalifa can't go back to uh, Lebanon because she's getting threats from the government, whatever. And that's, I don't agree with that. Mm. But the, the idea was, I thought that was so cool. Why don't you just own the fact that you did porn and now you've made different decisions in your life? Mm. I would have so much fucking respect for that. Yeah. Instead of going back and retroactively saying that all of this was bad, but not just bad for you, it's bad for everyone. And that it's, it's, it's denigrating society. That's the problem that I have with this. It's like there was so much that she could have done in that instance. Again, I'm not saying that her, her beliefs aren't valid. It's just like, when I, I remember she did, oh, it was a call her daddy interview one time. And I'm listening to the two of them talk, and this thing was like the number one pot. They were beating Joe Rogan that week. I remember it was a huge, huge interview. And I just remember thinking, like, you're literally doing this episode, like leading everyone in on podcasts as far as downloads is concerned, because of what you did, and then complaining about that thing you did. And it's just so crazy. I the, my, the point is there's consequences for your actions. If I took steroids my whole life, and later on when my kidneys fail, I'm not going to blame the pharmaceutical company or the Mexican drug doctor that I bought the steroids from. Yeah. I have to take responsibility for my actions. I mean, do you think, do you think like, Ronnie Coleman regrets doing Right, voice? he does not. Dude, have you heard the interview? Ronnie Coleman says he squatted 850 one time, and his only regret in life is that he didn't do it three times. Yeah. And he, it destroyed his back. Ronnie Coleman can't walk anymore. Yep. Yeah, and I, I listened to Earl Campbell, one of the greatest running backs of all time. He's in a wheelchair now. He played at UT Austin, won the Heisman Trophy, and then he, uh, he fucking uh, played for the Oilers. He was a monster. The guy was an incredible running back. He can't walk anymore. He doesn't regret it. He understands the consequences for what he did, and that's the problem. It's like what, what's happened is when they don't take responsibility for what they did, that's the actual message, Sterling. The, mm. Sterling, the message is not get rid of porn. Guess what, guys? I'm not getting rid of porn. Just, you heard it here first. Porn's not going away. The actual message is don't take responsibility for your actions. Become a victim and yell loud enough to where you don't have to pay for what you did. That's what I can't stand, that, that, that level of, of hypocrisy. And, and that anyone who tries to paint themselves as a victim, because we're in this inverted society now where down is up, up is down, 
and like if if you're a, a big enough victim you're you're celebrated whereas we used to celebrate the person who came from nothing and, and made something of themselves now we try and celebrate you know the person who's just you have enough virtue signaling points to stand out above everyone else as a bigger victim and i can't, and i it's just uh, but that's why they're doing each other's podcast now yeah. do you see that it's like it's like it's like voltron combining to or, or the the autobots combining to make one massive autobot of fucking virtue signaling on one part. And it's just so crazy to me. And it, 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 it's, I'm not upset at them. It's just, by the way, if what ha Mia Khalifa happened to her, well, like she was legitimately trafficked, then that's horrible. I'm not saying that that part's okay. My, my issue is afterwards, the complaints I hear from Lana Rhodes is that she doesn't make enough money off the porn she made, which means what? There's an amount of money that she could have been paid to where then this would have all been okay. Yeah. Okay, now I understand. It's not the, that a crime was committed, you just didn't get compensated enough. So now you have an OnlyFans additionally. That's the part I'm trying to say. You, you see what I'm saying? Yeah. If she, again, I'm gonna say this for the fifth time. I legitimately, if she legitimately feels like she was taken advantage of, that that's her experience and I'm not trying to denigrate that experience. But my point is now after the fact, then get away from it. But she's not even trying. She's leaning heavy into this, calling herself Lana Rhodes on a podcast. That's the that's the issue that I have. Mm. Um, let's let's go with this real quick. Uh, you had a conversation with uh, the the guys on uh, crypto the other day. I heard you on Rule One talk about this. You obviously have a close relationship with Andrew and Tristan Tate. Uh, can you just summary go over what your experience has been like in like the last two weeks? Yeah. So <clears throat> it's been. Uh, I mean, obviously, you know the the their close friendship circle we all we're all friends with each other we all talk to each other so i'm i'm you know getting as much information as i can from you know guys who are a bit closer to the source uh you know it sucks to to see some of your best friends get just completely slandered across every mainstream news outlet across the planet completely taking you know their their entire reputation cast aside like everything under the sun lied about them and it's man like Especially like the crap that's been going on, like the whole pizza Greta Thunberg thing, the the whole thing about their Bugatti getting seized, all fabrications, all yeah, complete so, lies. So, so let's let's do this real quick, just a little as a litmus test for anybody who's out there watching. <laughs> if you had a news source that told you that Andrew Tate was caught because of a pizza he bought in Romania, then let's go ahead and block that news source. That means that's not a legit. You know they're saying things that are objectively false, so that's not a, a, the news source. He, there's this thing called passport control. When you come into Romania, he had a residence in Romania and posted on social media that he was fucking in Romania. So the idea that he was caught because of the Greta Thunberg uh, post, if if someone is saying that is what happened, go ahead and delete that source. You know that is not a reputable source because she's their poster child, right? So of course. For, so for them, that's a fantastic narrative to paint. Is like, ah. Oh, our, our girl Greta got the big bad For guy sure. Andrew. Listen, but, I I get you know, it. It's it's, it's, the, it's the Rock versus Stone Cold Steve Austin. Yeah, I, yeah, I get that part. Yeah, it's nuts. Um, and then also any any news source that told you that his Bugatti got seized, you can scratch that. Too. Yeah, and if you if you have heard unequivocally that his Bugatti was seized, then that's correct. Also, any any news organization that told you or any content creator that told you before this this last uh, arrest that he was arrested for human trafficking back in April delete them as well yeah. that did not happen the thing is I'm not even I don't know what the physical evidence is I'm waiting on the physical evidence that's what I think that's what Patrick Bed David said even fucking uh, Hassan Abdi said the same thing Spencer Cornelia and and uh, Rollo we've all said the same thing we're waiting for the evidence to come out uh, from my experience with him I made a video the other day stating that it doesn't make sense to me just because of the fact that he had women throwing themselves at him and because he was making somewhere in the area between six and 10 million, maybe $20 million a month legally, yeah. not through the casinos. And so I'm supposed to believe that he's going to, by the way, you don't human traffic for sex, you human traffic for money. That's the point of it. So he needs to make a couple of extra hundred dollars by human trafficking people on a webcam. And that's what he was going to do, even though he's, that's, that's what was the question I had. And then I had all these people saying, well, you don't understand how abuse works. I understand that. But what you're, what you're intimate, what I'm intimating is a sane brain would not have done this. You're intimating that he's insane. Now you're the one reaching uh, uh, for a, a conclusion. So that's what, what, one of the issues that I have. I don't know if Andrew's guilty or innocent. My, the the preponderance of evidence that I've seen so far, which is very little, would indicate to me he doesn't have a motivation to do this. That's what I am saying. And uh, so there's supposed to be six women in a uh, six victims. By the way, tonight on the 11th, Vice is actually going to come out with interviews from some of those women. Oh, okay. So that, yeah. that, let's talk about that as well. But yeah. These, there's supposed to be six victims in this case. Two of them went on to Romanian TV yeah. publicly and said, what the hell? We're not victims. Yeah. Two of the six women that are in the prosecution's case 
defended Andrew. Yeah. And it's like, okay, well, like there's, there's, there's no leg for this prosecution to stand on. It's like a complete stitch up, in my opinion. Obviously, like, I'm his friend. I think I, I'm... So I'm I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't know that last part. That's really interesting. It's insane. Um, so that happened. Obviously, the, the Bugatti is actually, like, it's at his friend's driveway in Dubai. Yeah. It's in Dubai. The, the Bugatti isn't remaining. It hasn't been seized. What, and oh, two, two reasons you know that's, that's a fact, right? One, if they actually did seize the Bugatti... I guarantee you there'd be photos of it getting seized all over the internet. Of course. And two, he ain't going to take his Bugatti to Romania in the middle of the winter. Yeah. To, what, he can drive it along the, the icy roads? No, he's going to leave it in Dubai and race it in Dubai. Yeah. Simple. It's, basic, yeah. Like it's, it's just basic common sense, right? But then you... I think it's a good thing you said to like, okay, where did you, who, who was telling you this? Compl- all these fabrications? Now you know that they're not reputable sources for information. Because it just takes a little bit of, you know, logical rational thinking to realize okay these things are no there's no there's no basis behind these the video he did one time i believe it was for webcam where he he slaps the girl in the face and then later on the girl comes out and states hey we did this consensually yeah, it's his girl, it's his it was his girlfriend yeah. i'd been living with him for four years by the way she further there's also if you guys want to check on no jumper there's a video of her stating i lived with andrew for several years and there is no way he did any of this yeah. she is one of the, the the people who said this when i show i had a, a a content creator and a huge influencer hit me up the other day and i and i she knows who she is and i and i care about her opinion very much but she is a feminist and she was explaining to me how Andrew was dangerous and that you should understand that this is uh, the pattern of abuse. And my response to her was, you have conflated your opinion about him being misogynist for him being guilty of a felony. Yeah. This is where, this is the ultimately where the super, super dangerous situation comes. Everyone who I've spoke to about OJ Simpson said he is one of the most charming motherfuckers you will ever meet in your whole life. I met OJ a couple weeks ago at a Halloween party. What's up, OJ? Seems like the nicest guy in the world. The evidence, however, does not uh, indicate that. I just got to figure out why Ronald Goldman's blood was in his car. That's the only thing I'm trying to figure that one out, okay? Explain that one to me, OJ. So that's, that's, that's the thing, right? It, because of how you feel about a person individually, right, this doesn't indicate... Uh, I don't like Skip Bayless. I think the dude's a piece of shit. I don't know if you know who he is. He's a commentator, sports commentator in the United States. If something came out tomorrow that said Skip Bayless beat his wife, a lot of people without any evidence would be like, yeah, I fucking hate that guy. Skip Bayless beat his wife. Wait for the evidence, though. Right. You have conflated your opinion about somebody's words with their guilt in a felony case. This is I've seen this repeatedly. Now, I'm going to say something else. It's happened the other way, too. I'm willing to wait for the evidence. If something comes out, there's incontrovertible evidence that they're guilty, I would have to accept it if I saw it, because I'm not going to stand for, for human trafficking. I don't think I'm going to see that, though, especially after what you just said. Yeah, and, and, and just, just so I can interject yeah. really quickly, for, for me, it's sort of, a lot of people are having that reaction, like you said, like, oh, they have an opinion on Andrew, they don't like the way he communicates things, yeah. so therefore he's guilty because they don't like the guy, right? Yeah. With me and, and you know, guys like Justin and, and you know, our friends at Stuff, like, we've spent long periods of time well, yes. with the man, Andrew and Tristan, personally, no cameras on, just the boys hanging out, driving cars, chilling in his, in his house. Like, and we've, we've seen the man behind the camera. You know what I'm saying? Like, cause this, you know, everybody on social media has like a social media persona to a degree. For sure. And we've seen the real Andrew. We've seen the real Tristan. And these guys aren't human traffickers. These guys yeah. aren't, these guys aren't, you know, abusers, and it's just like. So for when I when I come out and say, okay, I'm like I'm not going to wait for evidence because I like I know this person, but that's because I've actually met the guy and spent quality time with these guys, versus you know, someone who's maybe maybe met them once or talked to them on a podcast something mm. like that. I can see the difference there, you know. Yeah. But yeah, people people can not like the way that Andrew says things and communicate certain ideas, but that does not make him guilty. It's very, you guys don't understand, it's a very slippery slope. People do this all the time. There's a guy who assaulted me one time in a nightclub, uh, and then afterwards, uh, it, there's this uh, podcast called Drama Alert. A separate person said, uh, accused this person, person X, I'm not gonna say what his name is, of nine women, okay? Crazy, the crazy accusations. And my first thought was, yeah, they're gonna get that motherfucker. And then I waited for the evidence. There was no evidence. Even though I don't like him, I'm not going to say he did that shit because I have to. I have to be careful of my own bias because I may not like someone to then accuse them of something that I have no physical evidence for, and that's where things get scary. So the three groups that I was talking about before: the people who believe that he's a dangerous or misogynist, therefore ipso facto he must be guilty; 
Then there's the people who like have been in the red pill community and this, this content is such red meat for them that they have to believe he's innocent or that they have to say he's innocent or they realize that if they say he's innocent and he's actually guilty, it doesn't hurt their brand at all, yeah. right? That's the second group. And then the third group is you guys. You guys have actually spent time with him. You have some experience with him. You have more, more experience than these people who are talking about it online. I know you've spent a lot of time with him. I know Justin, who I very much trust, uh, uh, very much admire, Justin Waller, has said the same thing. And so that's a third group of opinions, right? Yeah. And then there's me, who I, I have to wait. I have to wait. I don't. I, I wish I knew uh, J uh, Andrew better. We just text on, on WhatsApp, that's it. But I have to wait to see what the evidence is. But m from what I've seen, and I work in statistics, the statistical probability to me seems like this... I'm going to ask you uh, um, a hypothesis. You tell me what you think about this. Um, Andrew had probably had to work with some people to get those casinos in Romania. Some of those people may be of ill repute. And then at some point, he's like, I'm making 20 million a month. I don't want to do this anymore. I'm going to leave this business. And they're like, no, you're not. And let, let, let me go talk to my buddy over here at the police station. And then poof, this happens. Uh, from what I know about that casino set up in Romania, that, yeah, that wouldn't have been a scenario. Okay. Yeah. From, from my understanding of the way that. Again, it's just hypothesis. I've heard, yeah, I've yeah. heard people bring this up, I, this idea of organized crime. Yeah, that his his casinos are like legit businesses. Okay. Yeah, there's, okay. There's, there's there's nothing there's there's nothing like you know secretive or, or or you know controversial about that particular business. It's like you know it's just it's just a regular casino. Yeah. Yeah, and it's yeah it wasn't like set up through like a dodgy organization. Got it. it okay. Was, it was not like a money laundering thing. It's all like like it's literally like all tracked like electronically. Mm. Like every single penny is accounted for, you know. It's all not like it's not like a um, it's not like physical cash is being handed back and forth, mm. like you know, at like a craps table or something. It's all done electronically, electronically through machines, so he can monitor exactly how much how, every penny he's making. Yeah, it's like a cash phone. business, man. That's yeah. a, that's, a, that's so, a, but yeah. it's, but it's all completely monitored. Got so it. it's like all legit. It's not like this money laundering thing, you know. And I've and I've I've lost money in this casino. I've gone, gone and gambled on it. So yeah, I've, I've seen it up close, you know. Okay, good, because I didn't have that insight. Yeah. Okay, it's just a hypothesis that I'd heard before, but that makes a lot of sense. Okay, beautiful. So your intent, your belief is, what, what do you think is going to happen in the next 30 days? Obviously, he, he, he lost his appeal yeah. yesterday. Yeah. Uh, what do you think is going to happen well, in the so, next 30 days? So now days? They're, they're detained for the remaining... Uh, but like, the remaining just, just to say, in the United States, we can't do this. You are either, you are arraigned, okay, and then you are given a bail hearing, and then afterwards, you are held in custody until the date of your trial, unless you make bail, in which case you are not. There is this third limbo thing that they do in, in Romania where they have these blocks of 30-day periods up to 150 days mm. that they can hold someone. I don't... I. I believe he's been charged. I don't know if he's been arraigned or if he's had a bail hearing or how that's worked, but it's a very different thing that we cannot do in the United States. In the United States Constitution, we talk about having the right to a speedy trial. Right. Get in, in, apparently in Romania, they don't have that same thing in their constitution. <laughs> it doesn't look like it. So it's a, little, it's a little different. So this whole 30-day period while investigators go through your shit, this does not exist in the United States. No. You have about 72 hours to hold someone before you charge them, and then after you charge them, then they get arraigned, and they go to a, the, and then they are either given or denied bail. And that, they don't... They, they don't seem to have gone through that. No, because so so they got they will go through the remainder of these thirty days. Then they can. I think there's three different possible scenarios. One is they that it gets extended up to, up to like another month or, or two or three. I think. Yeah, that's one option. There's blocks of thirty day periods that yeah. go up to one hundred and fifty days. Yeah, there you go. Mm -hmm. That's one option. Another option is they're detained like on house arrest. I guess you could say like yeah. they have to stay within their premises. Uh, and a third one is they have to uh, they stay have to stay within the country and they're like. But they can't leave the country for sure. Yeah, so like degrees of like freedom within Romania, basically. Those are the three different options I had that's yeah. going to eventuate. But I mean, I, I can only hope that you know that truth prevails and they, they they get out, they get innocent, they get they get released, and we can go back to conquering the world. But, one of the things they talk about in the Vice interview is that one of the girls had made a complaint back in April, and the the police said we don't have enough evidence to charge them. Right. That was one of the things that happened. And the the difficulty is, and this is not pro or anti Andrew Tate. The difficulty of charging a case after the fact, long after the fact, is extremely difficult to do this uh, because, of, because of the lack of physical evidence and there's also the he say, she said kind of stuff. Um, I, let's talk about this, the Tory Lanez thing. Do you see the whole Tory Lanez situation? Uh, basically, uh, the, the, Tory Lanez was convicted of shooting Megan Thee Stallion in the feet. Um, and it, she, they were in a car. Tory Lanez was in a car with this girl named Kylie, uh, and, or Kelsey, sorry. And Kelsey and Tory Lanez both have gunpowder residue on them. Uh, Megan the Stallion said that Tory Lane shot her. The the fragments hit hit her in the feet, and then she she made that uh, she made that statement. And then there's also a surgeon who says that they pulled the bone, the bullet fragments out of her feet. 
And then there's people out there saying, well, no, Tory Lanez is innocent. I think Kelsey did it. And my whole thing is, well, I don't, and they keep going, there's these uh, text messages. And the text message is Tory Lanez apologizing. And people are like, no, 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 he's apologizing for something else. And I'm like, I don't care if he's apologizing for something else. I don't care that OJ was a good guy. And I don't care if you think uh, Andrew Tate's messages are misogynistic. Physical evidence is physical evidence. And what I think is additionally dangerous are these 10 second clips that I'm being sent by these people who don't like Andrew Tate that are taken out of three hour podcasts. And these 10 second clips are being treated as if this is the prosecution's case. Yeah against him. This is the part that's very scary for me. I know very well you could take things that I, I do a three hour podcast every week. You guys could take things that I say out of this podcast and make me look like a fucking fool. I probably look like a fool already. But that's the point. It's like that that to me is additionally scary how these clips are being used against him when they're taken completely out of context. I mean speaking of that, this the whole Vice piece that's come out recently. Yeah. So they I was I was there in Romania when Vice was filming. Yeah. I was at the event they were filming. That's right. So Andrew yeah. gave them permission to come. Yeah. Yeah. So so the so the the reporter was with them in Romania. He was he was in their their podcasting studio at their house for a bit. Then he came out <clears throat> and joined this event we all we all did together. And he got in like a cage fight and, and fought with like a professional MMA fighter. And yeah. Yeah. Everyone everyone there supported the guy. They gave him like a standing ovation. We all cheered him on. Gave him a fantastic experience. Right in that in that you know community that brotherhood and looking at what Vice have decided now all of a sudden this this was filmed like six months ago by the way we were expecting it to come out within like a month or two and they they were talking about oh we're probably gonna release it within a month or two and they didn't they like they didn't release it because they couldn't find a way to make Andrew look bad yeah like we there was it was so overwhelmingly positive everything they caught on camera every everybody they interviewed at that event everyone they talked to. It was nothing but positivity mm. about Andrew. And it's like, the, like Vice was sitting on this all this footage, like, well, what are we going to do with this? We can't make him look like a bad guy. And then, lo and behold, six months later, he gets put in detention, and it's like, oh, now we can release it, and now we can put a spin on it, and we can add all this stuff from, like you, you've just said, take these really short clips out of context because Andrew can't defend himself now because he's sitting in detention. And uh, on, like, if anyone thinks that Vice is somehow like unbiased journalism you are completely delusional. oh when you read that when you listen to the questions he asks and see the uncomfortability when they have him in the in the war room or whatever it's it's pretty obvious that yeah. they, they had a bias and and and, and they deli they they cut and clip that together in a certain way it's not it's not like verbatim as he said he would say this question that andrew replies this vice is notorious for taking stuff out of context and clipping and moving things around like again and again these guys are not not acting in good in good faith. So speaking of not being in good faith, I'm going to bring up another story. There was a woman named Jill Shively back in 1994 who saw O.J. Simpson drive from the Rockford House to the um, I'm sorry, from the Bundy House to the Rockford House. Uh, Rock, I'm saying the name, name wrong. It doesn't matter. He saw she saw O.J. Simpson with her own eyes. Then she goes on, I believe Sally Jesse Raphael, or she goes on some show and she expresses that she saw O.J. Simpson do this thing. And then uh, uh, the District Attorney Garcetti. Uh, Gil Garcetti, who I think later became mayor, decides we're not going to use her testimony because she was compensated to go on a fucking TV show to give her testimony before the jury was picked. Does this sound familiar to you? Well, the incredible, like to me, what Vice is doing is they're the ones clout jacking Andrew's name because what if this woman believes that she saw a thing, if she believes she, whatever her experience is, that's fine. She can testify to her experience. If she believes she was extorted, she can testify that, whatever. That's not my point. I don't have a problem with that. What I have an issue with is that Vice has now decided before voir dire, for those of you who don't know, this is jury selection, before voir dire has even been completed, they're going to put out a special where she is giving her testimony without any ability for cross-examination and she's doing so anonymously. Okay? I understand why she do it so anonymously for her own protection. I totally get that. The point is, there's a place for that. It's called a trial. After the trial, do your interview. That's totally fine. Before the trial, there is no other point than other... Uh, Vice getting clout, clout jacking on this, trying to get popular, trying to get clicks, and them trying to sway jurors. There's no other point for this. This is the reason why in the United States, like let's just say you watched a murder happen and they were gonna call you to testify. If you go get paid to give your interview to TMZ, the, de the prosecution won't call you to the stand because the defense is going to come to you and be like, I'm sorry, uh, how much did TMZ compensate you in order to do this? And that's what's going to happen in this case. This girl, I don't know if you see, they, do a, they blank out her wrist because she has a tattoo on her wrist. Right. It's not gonna be very difficult to figure out who she is when you have six, six witnesses you're gonna call to the stand. She goes on there and they're gonna be like, uh, ma'am, were you on Vice? 
Did they compensate you? Did they get you a hotel room? Did they buy you a sandwich? Did they pay for your, did they pay for anything? Because we got the receipts. Remember, ma'am, you're under oath. If that happens, then all of a sudden her testimony is thrown out. You see what I'm saying? Mm. And so it's a very interesting situation where I think it's very irresponsible for them to do that. I know why they're doing it. Obviously, you know why they're doing it too. This is, this is the time to do it. Because what if he got out of jail, right? What if he got out of jail on the 10th? Then it wouldn't, it wouldn't look as good. But for them to do this, for them to have a, uh, an eyewitness come out and say this before the jury had been picked, for people like, well, Andrew Tate's dangerous. He's not making content. He's, not, he's in jail. Who, is he hurting someone? He's in fucking prison. Like what, how, what content is he creating that's going to hurt somebody? No, let's wait. That's the reason why Judas Prudence works the way it, it does. You're, you have the right to face your accuser. And in this case, he doesn't. This woman has gone on and she's, um, she's given this Vice interview. The Vice interview is going to go out before they're able to, before he even gets a, a, a chance to find out when there's a trial, they're, they're going to do this. I think that that is extremely unprofessional. You know what? But remember back in I think was it was it April of this earlier this year when yep. they got when they got the uh, um, the kidnap they were uh, accused of kidnapping that for American, sure that American chick right and if, if everyone who's not familiar with that story basically like Tristan was seeing this girl yes American chick she came out to Romania she posted something on her Instagram story her boyfriend back in America sought recognized the Tate's house in the Instagram story called her up like yo what are you doing at the Tate's house and she lied to her boyfriend in America and said oh I I I, I I'm, was forced to come here. Yeah, they don't want to be here. They, they, won't, be they here. won't let me leave or yeah. something to that effect. Something yeah. like that. So he calls the embassy and the embassy gets involved. The American embassy gets involved, cops throw the house, blah, blah, blah. Obviously, completely innocent. All the CCTV footage at the house exonerated. So there is CCTV, CCTV footage of her going out, grabbing a pizza, yeah. going back into the house, and then later getting in an Uber of her own volition. Yeah. Okay. Gates That's, which, Gates, which is the reason why there was no case. Yeah, gates wide open. They can come in and out, right? Yeah. But during that whole episode... When all that was hitting, you know, the, the, the media, you had, there was multiple ex-girlfriends of Andrews who were being approached by mainstream news outlets yeah. and being offered very large sums of money to give a damning character testimonial about him. Like, to basically shit, trash talk Andrew behind his back. They were literally trying to bribe all of his ex-girlfriends. And none of them caved. None of them. So let's hold on. Let's bring this up. Hold on to that point. When uh, the Bill Cosby thing happened, he was accused of raping 54 women. 54 came out and said this. There was no woman who came out and said, yeah, Bill Cosby would have never done that. They all agreed. And the same thing with, uh, with uh, Harvey Weinstein. Harvey Weinstein had sexually assaulted or not sexually assaulted, but he had um, coerced these women into performing sexual acts for him. They all agreed. Like there was no, there was no like, ex-girlfriends being like, no, he would have never done that shit. All of them were like, yes, in agreement. In this case, I have yet, other than the, the, the six defendants, or the six um, victims, well, four, 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 four victims, six. because you said two of them have come out and said we're not victims. Other than that, I have never heard a single woman complain about him, other than I have actually had some women say, be like, oh, Tristan's a player. Okay, Tristan's a player, not a felony. Not yeah, a felony. Not, a, not, not, a not illegal. Not illegal. Okay. Not illegal to be a felony. And, uh, and, and Tristan would agree he's a player. Yeah. <laughs> I had, uh, well, one girl, I went on a podcast with her and she told me she was dating Tristan and she was like, oh, wow, he's kind of a player. Okay, cool. Not a felony. Not a felony. Well, we'd have some, <laughs> we'd have some VIP hosts and male strippers in Las Vegas in prison under the jail right now if that was a felony. Um, yeah. So, so I, I thought that was interesting. I just wanted to point that part out uh, as well. Anyway, go back to your point. Um, you were talking about um, the people around Andrew. As in all of his, um, like all of his exes and, and yeah, yeah, talking about yeah, his basically exes. Every, yeah, every single one of them has come out and defended him. Yeah, you know, and like you just said, with the whole with the like Cosby example or the, or the Weinstein example, it's like every girl who's had a romantic relationship with the with the man is defending him and saying this is he would not do this. Yeah, this is not his character. He's not a human trafficker. He's not an abusive guy, plain and simple. Now there's. I was looking through actually a couple, uh, some of the uh, like the prosecution statements and like the, the the testimonies from a couple of these women who are you know alleging to be uh, victims of this whatever, and it was funny looking at some of the details. They would say like, so one of them was saying, oh he he flew us out to Romania, and then uh, like under the guise of like we're going to get married, and then put us up in a house, and then they call it the lover boy method in the in the yeah. original indictment, and it, and I'm and. That happens, and then and then she say, says something like, um, "There's armed security at the house, which is stopping us from like leaving and stuff like this." And I'm looking at these things, and I'm like, "All of the like, I've I I know Andrew and Tristan's living situation. This is all complete horseshit. 
what she's saying. Like, they have armed security 24-7 because they're two of the most famous people in Romania, if not the planet right now, to literally protect themselves and all of the women that come there to keep them all safe. Anyone is free to come and go on, on that compound. I know that because I've, I've been there. I've had girlfriends stay there with me and come in and out as they like, as they please. No one's detained there. And two, it's like, no, he doesn't, Tri Andrew and Tristan have both said this publicly many times. They don't, they don't live with women. They don't live with their girlfriends. They like, it's Andrew, Tristan and Luke, their cousin. They live with the boys. They've never lived with, with one of their girlfriends. So they, so obviously like the girlfriend is going to live in a different house. Like he is paying for her house. It's, and to me, it's like, oh, like the, her, all these details of her testimony, like I'm, I'm just seeing holes in all the story here. And I'm like, this is such a, a complete fabrication. I don't know where she's coming with this. Do you know, I don't know if you know a girl called um, Eliza Blue? Are you no. you familiar with her? Uh, I'm familiar with that name, but I don't know who it is. So Eliza Blue is a big, uh, like she's a tr human tra a trafficking survivor advocate. Okay. Right. But I'm a big fan of her work. As well, like so. Basically, for the last like few years, she's been pushing heavily to get like a uh, uh, child abuse material taken off Twitter, for example. Sure. Right. So, uh, like I said, I'm a big. I'm a big fan of her work, but unfortunately, she's kind of got she's got it wrong on Andrew right now. So yeah. she she's I think I think she's been in, in touch with one of these uh, alleged victims or something. So she's you know, uh, um, you know, supporting their side of the story or whatever. And she released this statement a while ago on Twitter, like, like a, f a few days ago. And in the statement, one of the sentences is like. Uh, it's something to the effect of, it's it's funny how all the people who are defending Andrew Tr Andrew Tate have had photographs with him. Uh, it's all and it's, she keeps going. It's almost like they were all uh, they've all been invited to his house and uh, have had his harem of women pleasure them however they feel. Basically insinuating that guys like me, Justin, yeah. fresh and fit, Sneeko, uh, have have engaged in like human trafficking orgies in their living room or something like this. And I'm like. To me, it, it's it's funny, like seeing someone who I do respect, like I do respect Eliza Blue and what she does, and but how she can get it so wrong, purely based upon like someone's reputation online, and and based around like how much this guy has been slandered and smeared by mainstream media, she can make that giant conclusion out of thin air. Uh, for the people who are very much working against human trafficking. Here's the message that I have uh, as far as that's concerned. Amber Heard did not help the Believe All Women cause. Totally, yeah. Amber Heard set that cause. If I had any feminist in here, you would agree with me. Amber Heard set that cause back a hundred years. What you don't want is that to happen again. If I was in that, if I'm in that camp, which by the way, I am, I work with several human trafficking charities and I work with several domestic abuse charities. Okay, you can go check my record. Go on my YouTube, bro. Google me. I work with them, which is why this was very important to me. If this is true, I'm not going to stand for human trafficking. If this is not true, accusing men of human trafficking when they aren't human trafficking hurts the cause of stopping human trafficking. I don't understand how this is difficult for people to hear. If you keep crying foul, if you keep crying wolf, eventually they stop coming. Yep. One of the things that Me Too did that was really smart in the beginning is they went after the fucking cold, the hardcore cases. Harvey Weinstein wasn't guilty. He was a thousand percent guilty when they did that. Now what happened is they started leaking into the, into the, um, oh, what's the guy's name? Uh, the one who was on um, Parks and Rec. Um, I can't remember the, the Indian dude. They went after him. Oh gosh. I oh, can't the, com the comedian? Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, Aziz Ansari? Uh, Aziz Ansari. Yeah. When they went after Aziz Ansari, who got a, a, like legitimately got a consensual blowjob from a woman, and then afterwards she wrote on her blog that she felt uncomfortable when he bought her like an Uber ride home and didn't force her to do anything. When the Me Too movement went after him, I was like, oh, oop, you fucked up. If you had just stuck to the guys who were super Uber, the fucking Matt Lowers and the Charlie Roses, and the, if you had just stuck with those guys, we'd be fine. Mm. But you didn't. You went after, okay, Louis C.K. I totally understand what he did was inappropriate, but he was in another room masturbating again i am not in favor of what he did i think it's fucking weird as shit but the point is like if they had just stuck down the lane and just stuck with the guys who were guilty they would have so much more credibility as opposed to coming off as this ultra woke left-wing agenda they would have they would have um union on both sides if they were actually showing to go after people and not let political lines get in the way if andrew turns out to be innocent this hurts that movement that's what i'm warning but the problem is Andrew's so popular, they have to go after, they have to grab on this balloon. 
Yeah. They have to cloud jack this one. And I've just, like, you're trying to make an example of someone. And I, I promise you, this will come back to bite you. Because what's going to happen is, dude, Amber Heard, whenever the Believe All Women thing comes out, watch on the internet. Girl, guys keep bringing up Amber Heard. He, she shit on the bed. She lied on this. By the way, for those of you who don't know, Johnny Depp did not punch Amber Heard. There's no evidence to it whatsoever. Johnny Depp won his defamation case because she said he punched her when, he, when she was talking to a magazine. He sued her for defamation and he won the defamation case. Okay? This, what if this happens again? I would, I would say if I was a person who was in support of these human trafficking charities, I would be very, very careful to jump to conclusions here because if you're wrong, this hurts your case way more than it could possibly help you. Yeah. That's the point I'm trying to make. Um, let's talk about another thing. I love this. Uh, you going into this was Johnny, Sil Johnny Sins being blue-pilled. Okay. Uh, by the way, shout out to Karen Lee who follows this podcast. Um, uh, I met him for the first time at AVN. We, met, we did a funny interview together. I can't believe it's so crazy when like BJ Baldwin or Terran Tactical or I find out that Jay Cutler or some of these other people hit me up and they're like, I watch, I'm blown away that you guys watch my podcast. So thank you. So, some of the people that I admire when I find out they watch my podcast, I'm blown away by it. Uh, one of the guys is Karen Lee and uh, he came up to me. I met him for the first time. I thought maybe it was like a bot on his on Instagram writing me, but no, I met him out on a red carpet. The motherfucker in completely uh, recognized me. Anyway, I met, I saw him at AVN and he was standing next to Johnny Sins. I've never actually met Johnny Sins, but I know he's a very, very popular porn star. I saw the interview that he did with Logan Paul, where he had Kiss the Sins on there and they talked about how they met, how they got together. And then later on, she started filming individually. Can you go into that, the video that you made? Yeah. So that was an interesting experience for me. So that was one of the first things I saw when I got into the industry, when I moved to LA, right? I mean, I'm, I'm in LA for the first week and I go to like an, an, an you know, an industry party of some kind. And, uh, I was aware of, you know, Johnny Sins and Kissa Sins were in a relationship. And at the time, I believe Johnny was like living in Hawaii or something. This was, this is like five years ago, four or five years ago. But at this party and in walks it through the front door in work, in walks, uh, Kissa Sins on the arm of Marcus Dupree, who ha at the time was the reigning male performer of the year. So he's the king shit. Like he's the top dog and she's, she's walking on his arm and obviously they're, you know, they're in a, in a romantic way. And I'm thinking, Ah, oh, damn, that's a bit, that's a bit rough, for Johnny. Like I thought these, these two, I thought these two were in a relationship. What the hell's going on here? And I look, you look into like Johnny and Kissa Sin's uh, kind of, you know, backstory. So she was a fan of his. Yeah. She ended up. She's just. He was like, you know, he's like one of the most popular. Yeah. Male performers among amongst all the female talent. They all want to work with Johnny Sins. Yeah. Like super, super lovely guy from all accounts. Right. And I'm, I'm, I don't, I've got nothing against the guy. I'm not trying to shit on him or anything. I'm just, yeah. it's, just a, it's just an interesting Actually, example. Actually, we're, we're in favor of him. That's the point. Yeah. Like, this is, like, this is something that could have been avoided. Yeah. Like, you have the money and the clout and the pre-selection to create the life of your dreams, but you didn't, you kind of let it slip out of your hands. He, he, he had it. That's the thing. He yeah. had it with Kisser, right? So she was a fan of his. She slid into his Instagram DMs or something. Uh, they ended up, you know, hooking up together. Uh, he, he moved out to Hawaii with her. And they ended up running, uh, I think it was a website called, a pay site called Sins Life. I don't know if it's still around at the time it was going. And what they would do, they would fly out like two, three female performers from LA to Hawaii at a time and just have these like crazy sex orgies. Mm. And that was the entire website, which is him, POV, with his big old schlong out there, four or five girls yeah, hammering away on it. And I'm like, dude, you've got the life. You, you've like... You've won the game. Like, you, yeah. could, you keep doing what you're doing, you've got it made. And then all of a sudden, like, you know, after maybe like a year of this, she starts shooting like boy girl porn, like in mainstream in so LA. If you guys want to go back and watch the interview, it, the, the expression on Johnny's face, go back and watch the Logan Paul interview with Kissa and Johnny Sins. When she gets to the point where she's like, and now I want to film with mainstream talent, Johnny's like shoulder slump. And he, like, again, this is the dude who could have had anything he wanted. And then he, and then she goes off and does that. Like, here's the thing. The point that you said before, he had he legitimately looked like he was in love with her. Yeah, and and it, there's so many other ways that this could have, anyway. Keep going. I don't, I don't yeah, want, but I, I I think a large part of that was probably in like because he's they're flying uh, out all yeah. these industry girls. They're probably like whispering in her, having a you know a piece in her ear saying, "Oh, Kissy, you'd be amazing. You should go out to LA and shoot. You should go out to LA and shoot." And she's probably having like you know 
a good half a dozen to a dozen girls saying this to her. You can shoot, you can make money on OF. You can shoot this porn. There are probably some girls that were escorts who were like, hey, you can meet my client. Yeah. That kind of stuff too that was happening that, yeah. that, got the, that got her to say, hey, I should have agency too. She said she was crying every day. He would go to work. He would go to work and shoot with like 30 different girls a month. This is what she said in the interview with Logan Paul. And then, uh, and, then he, and then eventually she did it and he at first didn't have a problem with it and then later on was like very upset by the whole thing. Yeah. And he says he wishes that he had not let her go off and start filming like this. Yeah, and it's like, okay, so if he's the man in her life, he sh his his uh, his influence over her should have been stronger than these you know random women that they're bringing out to yeah. Hawaii. Her yeah. words, her words. I need one dude and several women to have sex with. She was actually fine with the arrangement before, before yeah. women come out come at me and be like, well, he can fuck a bunch of women. Why can't she fuck a bunch of dudes? She was totally fine in the arrangement that was going on. Then these women came to her and told her that she should film with other dudes. Yeah, and the thing, is, like, and it's like, okay, so she was like, he'd go to set and shoot, and she would be sad. Right? Yeah, she'd be sad. Okay, well, that that, that for a start, that's I'm not going to say that's a bad thing. That proves that she's in love with the man yes. for a start, right? Okay, well. Then what happens? Then she goes and, and shoots the she she goes and shoots with like random industry dudes, and what happens? The relationship ends. So it was better before. It was yeah. uh, unequivocally it was better. Or or <laughs> I g I'll give you another example. It would have been better if you want to go film with industry dudes. God bless you. We don't need to be in a relationship anymore. Yeah. Either one of those things would have been fine. But this is the the point. And if Rollo was here, we'll talk about this tomorrow night. Polly does not work for men. Yeah. This is a guy who's a male porn star who's a, who's agreeing with me here. Polly does not work for men. Women kiss a sins it, 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 unless you have a morbidly obese woman and like Justin Timberlake, then you're maybe you're even. <laughs> women have so many more options as far as men that they can go be with. Average, average looking women sleep with celebrities all the time. They have so many more options. And I know this because whenever I go to hedonism in Jamaica and there's the, these couples that are swinging, the women are just like, there's seven penises ready for all of them. And the dudes are like lucky to get a make out. They're all standing, holding their dicks like next to a fucking pizza place, just kind of like waiting for their drink to come while their wives are getting railed by six Jamaicans. And I'm just like looking at this. And it is not, it is so inequitable. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. So po poly does not work for men. Poly works for women. Polygyny, now here's the thing, people are going to say, well, polygyny, Michael, polygyny works for men. No, polygyny works for both. Yeah. Listen to me one more time. Polygyny works for both. Because one of the problems is women are like, no, you get to have sex with other women and she only gets to have sex with you. No, 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 no. We get to have sex with other women. Bingo. That's polygyny. What, what you're referring to is the, these women out here who are watching this and they're like, no, I dated this male stripper and then he cheated on me. That's cheating. That's not polygyny. That's cheating. You, what you got what, when, with a polygynous man is a man who was honest with you. When, and instead, you had a conversation with this before, which I thought was interesting, which was the conversation about uh, mismatch, mismatch sex drive. If right. the guy doesn't want to have sex with, uh, much with a woman, then it, it has to do with a situation where he may want to go see another woman, and then he's reinvigorated to see her again. Totally, totally. Yeah. Like, I think, I think if you take a guy who's, you know, in, say, in a relationship, in a long-term marriage, and he hasn't got a great, very big sex drive for his current partner, you, you take that guy out to the strip club for a night, bring him back home to his missus, he's ready to go. Yeah. Just by being, a, it's something as simple as that, just yeah. by being around other women, getting attention from beautiful women has a tremendous impact on the male sex drive. Dude, whenever I was with a girl and we had an arrangement where I could see other women, whenever I would go see other women, the I was so obsessed with my main girl the next day. Yeah. Or if we'd have a threesome, the next day I'd buy her flowers. Whenever I would have a threesome with my girl, we'd kick the other girl out, the unicorn would leave, and then I would I was obsessed with my girl. It's so crazy that women think they're being replaced. Yeah. How the fuck would we ever replace you? You brought a woman home. We're never going to replace you in a million years. You are actually the you're like you you think you're replaceable because she's prettier. There's pretty girls everywhere. Girls who do that for their man are not fucking replaceable. I don't understand this part. You are a fuck. You are the league MVP. You are first team all pro. <laughs> you're not replaceable. You're completely irreplaceable. Anyway, go ahead. I completely agree with that. Yeah, yeah. That it's 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 mind boggling to me. Like that women would kind of get insecure in that position. Yeah, because they just don't. They can't see that change in perspective of like. Oh, well, because I, sex, just, because sex just, means more to them. Yeah, if, if, if I just bring other girls to him, now I'm the queen. I ain't getting. I'm never going to get replaced. Like, yeah. What other girl is going to do that? It's just going to keep bringing an endless line of pussy to Mike to it. Yeah, man. it's really hard for women to grasp this. It 
if I have an option between I have a man girl and having sex with another girl, there's some variety and novelty to that. And that's a, that's a plus. Having sex with two girls at the way, same time is not twice as good. It's 800 times as good. It's exponential. It's exponentially better. I don't want to, if I'm in a relationship, I don't want to have sex with other women. I want to have sex with other, I want us to have sex with other women together. That is better than having, than see, sneaking around cheating on my girl. I don't want to do that. And it's so hard. Now I get why women don't feel this. A lot of women don't feel the same way. I know some women who absolutely feel the same way. But I know some women who don't feel the same way, and I understand why, because it's an evolutionary adaptation, you wanna protect the provider that you have, right? Uh, you wanna, and, and it's hard for them to see your provide, this man that you've uh, put all these resources in, or put all this effort in, being with another woman. I get that, I totally understand that. Uh, but the, the situation is, what I also find is that when a woman's been divorced, she gets out of a relationship, she's in her early 30s, late 30s, they seem to all be fine with this concept. Yeah. Because it's like it's like reality hit them so hard and they started to come to this realization like, oh, for men, sex really doesn't mean shit. It's like it really doesn't change. Oh, they still loved me. He cheated and he still loves me. I'm so confused. Because here's the reason why, and uh, this is the 500th time I've quoted this, when uh, the, the studies done in Dr. David Buss's book, When Men Behave Badly, uh, when women cheat in a relationship, uh, or sorry, when men cheat in a relationship, the men who cheat and the men who don't cheat report the same satisfaction in the marriage. When women cheat, they report less satisfaction in the marriage 83% of the time. One more time. When men cheat and men don't cheat, the same satisfaction in the marriage. When women cheat, they report lower satisfaction in the marriage 83% of the time. When men cheat, it is not because they want to end the relationship. When oh, yeah. women cheat, it is because they want to end the relationship. We cheat for different reasons. Like Men will cheat purely for variety. Which goes back to the kiss of sins thing. Yeah. That when kiss of sins was with other dudes, and this is going to sound like such a double standard, because it is a double standard. You can't bench press 300 pounds, ladies. I'm sorry. There is a double standard. Um, when, when Kiss of Sin sleeps with other, every time Kiss of Sin sleeps with another dude, it is way more deleterious to the relationship. Yeah. It, exponentially more deleterious to the relationship than when Johnny Sins is like going to work. Because for Johnny Sins, he is legitimately just going to work. For her, every time she's, there's these emotions that go along and oxytocin and dopamine, these, all these other things, whereas Johnny Sins, it is simply just a physiological reaction below his belly button and there's nothing else going on. I had this interesting perspective from a Muslim girl when I was out in Dubai last time. And she said, um, like, so she's, she's only been in two relationships. Her yeah. whole, she's like 30 years old. She's only been in two relationships her whole life, right? And she said, um, she had a really interesting perspective on, like, cheat on women cheating. She said, why would I go and sleep with another man and, like, risk diminishing the love that I have for my man? Yeah. Because I'm, if I sleep with another dude... She was saying, if I sleep with this other guy, I'm always going to, now I'm going to have something else to compare against my man. For sure. And it's going to either be better or worse, but either way, it, it, it's, it's putting him now in some kind of spectrum or scale to compare with, which I thought was really, really interesting. Like this idea, because women, like I said before, like dudes cheat for variety, women cheat to upgrade. Yeah. That's, it's plain and simple. Like it's, but it's a comparison game. It's like, oh, this this guy is some, slightly better than this dude, so I'm going to go over this guy. Yeah, men, men rearrange the roster and women look for a new coach. I like yeah. that, man. I like that analogy. Yeah, no, um, it, it's, and it's very, and I, I, I empathize with women not grasping this because I know my psychology is very different from yours because evolution made us different. I get that. I totally understand. But I do find that what happens eventually with almost every woman I talk to is there's a point in there after a big breakup, after a, a, women get red-pilled too, right? The, the horrible divorce, the, the guy was supposed to be Prince Charming, turned out he was lying, turned out the, the fuck boy who told you the truth was the only guy telling you the truth in your whole life. They go back and they have this like red pill moment for women and then they come back and they're like, oh, yeah, I would have been fine with that the whole time. You mean if he just told me he was going to see other women and he kept coming back to me and just never, never disrespected me in any way whatsoever? And then other women are like, this is very common, uh, was Andrews talked about, the Russian oligarchs, they never, no one expects them to be yeah. single. Everyone knows that they have girlfriends on the side. Yeah. The mafia in the United States, what was it, Friday nights was for the Gumars. I don't like that. I don't want to lie. I want us to do it together. I want to be Stockton and Malone, bro. I want to run the pick and roll with my girlfriend. I want to run the pick and roll. I want to get to the basket together. I don't want to fucking lie. And then I hear these other guys are like, no, you can't tell the girl because you're trying to explain a logical concept to someone who's not being logical. And there's some truth in that. That's hard, man. Mm. And then I meet some girls that are just all about it, just completely and totally about it. They don't want anything else. So it's, it's really interesting when, uh, when I see that whole situation, this idea, because I, I thought it was an interesting concept with you where you, you explain something that I had experienced personally, which was the idea was when I was with another woman, I wanted my girl more. Yeah. 
yeah. plain and simple. It's it's. I, I think, and I think, it's that's kind of like an eye-opening experience too, as a guy, when you you're with a you're with a girl, you, you truly love her, and then you step out, and you you know you have an experience with another chick on the side, and you just you just come back and you're reminded of all the reasons that you do love her in yes. the first place. For, for a woman's perspective on that in. Uh, that situation for a woman is completely different. She's going to come back. She's going to step out, sleep with another dude. She's going to come back and rationalize all the reasons why you're a piece of shit. Thank you. Yes. The backwards rationalization is going the opposite direction. And it comes off as like a double standard. And it is. Because I got a fucking X chromosome or Y chromosome. You don't. Like, that's that's the difference. And it's it's, it's like, this didn't just happen. When you also have this conversation about, is this cultural? Ishmael the bloodthirsty had 800 fucking, had 800 children. King Solomon had 800 wives or something like that. Well, something like one half of 1% of all the males on this planet uh, have the same Y chromosome as Genghis Khan. What do you think that happened? You yeah. think it's because he was a virgin? What the fuck? Like, I, it's ridiculous. Like, this didn't just start happening. If anything, it's, it's, social media has made this worse. There's a small number of men who have access to unlimited number of women and then a massive number of men that have none. And this was the other thing with the, the last thing I want to say about Andrew Tate. Because I, again, I don't know if he's innocent or guilty, but what I do know is that he spoke to men that no one was speaking to yep. and they rallied to what he was saying. So all the women out there who think that what he said was dangerous, I respect your opinion. However, I want to ask you a question question. 33% of men in the United States report having zero sexual partners in the last year. Is you, when you canceled Andrew Tate, did you fix that? No. 80% of men are deemed unattractive on social media. They don't have any shot. I'm sorry, on, on, on dating apps, Tinder, Bumble, and Hinge. When you canceled Andrew Tate, did you fix that? Oh, you didn't fix that. So you didn't do anything to alleviate the problem, just the symptom. One last thing. When you cancel Andrew Tate, did he become less popular or more popular? Did you fix that? It's like, learn from your own lessons. Do yeah. you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Canceling people, no matter what they say. I don't even want Kanye canceled for the anti-Semitic shit he said. I don't want anybody canceled. Kyrie Irving talking about the earth is flat. Keep talking, pimp. Yeah. I don't care. Whatever. Jesse Lee Peterson saying there was never such thing as racism. Go ahead, Jesse. Keep talking. Like, I don't care. Sunlight is the best disinfectant. That's what I'm saying. Exactly. Like, you put, like when, you, when you cancel people for, the, for having you know, like an, an opinion that, that riles people up, all you do is make people want to hear them more. Yes. I actually, I'm actually, at this point, I'm basically convinced that Andrew in, intended to get canceled, like massively yeah. canceled. I'm pretty sure it was actually the, entirely part of his plan yeah. was to get massively canceled like that. Because every time it happens to somebody, for the most part, they just become a lot more viral. And people will try as hard as they possibly can to get more he, information from he, that Here's person. another thing. You took a kickboxer from Romania and you put him on par with a former US president. Do you realize you did that, Twitter? Do you realize you did that Instagram? You put him on par with a former president who was canceled. Mm. That's, that's what you thought of him. You gave him that importance. Let's just say I completely different, disagree with everything Andrew says. When you canceled him, you made him stronger. Do you not see that? If you have a problem with that, go on TikTok right now and then swipe up and tell me how many, see if you make it 10 swipes before you see his, his face. Yeah. You did this. You were wrong. Admit you were wrong. And then the next thing is, let me tell you something. If you want to hang your hat on the fact that you think he's a misogynist and therefore he's guilty, you better be right about this one. Because if you're wrong, it's a big, big problem. Now, if he is guilty, he's guilty. I understand. And I would, listen, I, I haven't seen the physical evidence. But if he's not, then you went and jumped to a conclusion. I'm not going to jump to a conclusion. I'm going to tell you the physical facts that I've seen. I'm going to repeat the testimony that I've heard from you and from Justin Waller and from Lola Tomasi and from Fresh and Fit, who have all been with him and Sneeko. You guys have all been in his presence, hung out at his place, lived at his, stayed at his house. You guys have said, all, all of you, and, and by the way, his ex-girlfriend who lived with him for several years, all of them in complete unison have said the same thing. This is not what happened with Bill Cosby. Everybody came out and said that shit. Not what happened with Michael Jackson. Everybody came out and said the same shit. Not what happened with Harvey Weinstein. Everyone came out and said the same thing. For, in this case, I've not seen the same thing. That's all I'm pointing out. That's all I'm pointing out. Uh, and then lastly, you don't have an issue with the idea that because you disagree with someone, therefore they're guilty of a felony. Be careful. Be, I'm just saying, man, be careful because these these things are going to come back to haunt you. Yeah, that's all. That's all I'm saying. People, people love to to see people get torn down. For sure, they really do. Like, and it's it's quite interesting, like being on social media and you know if you, you know, I, I put out a tweet like a few weeks ago defending Andrew or whatever, and just seeing like the vitriolic response from haters, it's really. To me, like, I can't imagine what goes on in the head of a guy who spends his day on social media, like, trying, just, just either trolling or just trying to, like, mm. start arguments and hate on people. I've met them. They're bad. I yeah, try to get I, them. I, I just, I can't imagine ever living like that. Mm. So I, I really can't. You got to clean your mom's basement. 
Okay. You got to clean the, the crumbs off your, your stomach while you're sitting there watching. Uh, you're on a 4chan site watching anime. You got to do all that first. That's a, that's a rough day, man. And then you got to go on and you got to play uh, League of Legends all day. Man, it's... There's, you, can, you can pretty easily tell who is an Andrew Tate fan and who is an Andrew Tate hater just by looking at like, Isn't it weird? their body. Like, like, is he a fat piece of shit? He's probably an Andrew Tate hater. Yeah. Like, is he is he like jacked and making money? He's probably a fan of Andrew. Like, it's so easy to like spot them. It's unbelievable. And yeah, it, honestly, like half the time, I just can't. I feel kind of sad for some of these people. It's just like because they because they they get so angry and they feel so righteous trying to tear a guy like that down. What is that like? Where does that anger and hate kind of come from? Let me ask you a question. Jake Paul was talking about fighting Deontay Wilder. Do you want to see that? I would, I would pay money to see that. Now, what do I think is going to happen? I think, De- I listen, straight out to Jake. I met him a couple of times. Very nice dude. I think Jake Paul, I think Deontay Wilder would put him through the canvas. Are you kidding me? Of course I would want to watch it. Now, do I need Jake Paul to lose? No. Jake Paul is successful. I look at his success, and there's certain pit parts of his success I want to emulate. Not all of it. Some of it I want to emulate. When people are successful, I want to copy what they're doing, and I wish them more success. Bingo. I don't need them to fail. Yep. I'm watching people right now who need, like in order for them to get more views on YouTube, they need a certain outcome. Both sides, by the way. There are people who are pro-Andrew Tate who also know that if he's found innocent, they're going to get a bunch of views. And there's people Andrew, anti-Andrew Tate who know that if he gets convicted, they're going to get a bunch of views. I don't need him to fail. That's the problem. Ask yourself the question, do you have no idea about the physical evidence in this case and internally you need him to fail? That's where things get really dangerous. Mm. That's, that's one of the issues that I had. Um, this is really interesting. So uh, the, you guys can go look it up. Two of the most popular videos he ever did was porn star ratings. He actually talked about his experience with these porn stars. The only thing I could think of as soon as I heard this is what were the letters, the, the messages, did the companies hit you up? Something had to have happened after you made porn star ratings. Bro, bro you, know, you know what? The, those, those, those two videos I've had, it's a boring answer, man. I've had zero response from anyone in the industry. About that's crazy. Videos. Zero. But here's the, here's the reason why though. So I got mad kind of canceled from the industry like a year before that okay by putting out a couple of from a couple of tweets what was this what, what, what were the tweets that got you canceled so uh, two tweets got me canceled one was which i and both of these tweets are perfectly reasonable statements in my opinion one of them was um what is more uh damaging to a kid telling him that he's fat and need uh, uh, like at 16 telling him that he's fat and needs to lose weight or letting him get diabetes in his 30s yeah. Which of these two things is more damaging to him? You got canceled for that? They hated me for that. Really, really hated me I'll for that. I'll post that on Twitter today. Those exact <laughs> words. You got your fucking mind? What? Yeah. It, it was, the, the question was what was more damaging. The question isn't what's more progressive. Yeah. What? So that got me, that got, that was, that riled up a lot of people. And the other one that got a lot of people really riled up was me saying, um, if she calls herself a queen, a princess, uh, a bad bitch, or a boss babe, then she's probably not relationship material. Wow. Again, I mean, that's, the that's, that's your opinion. The lady in the room that's is laughing. That's your opinion. I, I, I mean, it was a joke. Hey, by the way, but let, <laughs> let me say this. Let me say this. There are women out there that are like, I'm a queen and I'm, I'm, a, I'm a bad bee, all these things, and you got your second master's degree and you have an awesome job. You want to know what's, what you are? You are a bad bitch. You are. You have internal self-worth. I'm con- congratulations to you. You make the world better. One of you hopefully cure cancer and maybe one of you becomes, you know, an incredible F-18 fighter pilot. I'm all for that but you aren't good relationship material. Yeah. Both, both things can be true. It is hard to date someone like that. And it's not because we're intimidated or we can't handle you. It's that the fact that as, as a man who's established, do you know what I have to look out at? A lot of different women who aren't going to give me. When, you remember that girl sitting next to Andrew Tate in the, in the, the, the interview he did with Pearly Things? And she goes, oh, these men can't handle me. And Andrew was like, I just did all this work. Like people are trying to kill me. People are trying to take what I have. They're trying to take my money away. They're trying to take my audience away. They're trying to take my clients away. I don't want to come home and handle shit. Yeah. I don't want to handle anything. It's not that I can't handle you. It's just like, why would I come home? I want a comfortable bed. Don't because I don't have a bed made of rocks doesn't mean I can't handle the shit. I didn't buy a bed made of rocks. I want a comfortable bed. When I come home, I want to feel comfortable. It's not that I can't handle you. Why would I want to put myself in a relationship like that? So what you're saying is true. Girl, you went out, you began you got your fucking um, ATC license and now you're a, a pilot for United. Go get it, girl. Awesome. You, you got your, your law degree and now you're an associate at your firm. Go get it, girl. Go get it. That's awesome. But it doesn't make you more relationship material. 
It makes it harder to date you. Yeah. And if you have a problem with that, don't get mad at me. Get mad at Tinder, Bumble, and Hinge. And get mad at the study of evolutionary psychology because they agree with the same things that I'm saying. It's just harder to date you. That's all I'm saying. It doesn't make any difference. It's not that we can't handle you. It's that we have options that are better than this. Yeah, they, they, they become the men that they actually For sure, date. man. Well, when women are like, yeah, I can have, I can do just like, man, I can have sex with no emotion whatsoever. Don't brag about that. That's not something to brag about. That's like bragging to men about how big your penis is. That we don't, as men, we don't want to hear that. That is an incredibly masculine trait to be able to fuck people and not have any emotions about it. That's a, that's a curse we have as men. And you as women are gifted this ability to fall in love with men that you have sex with. Keep that ability. How do you do that? You don't go running around sleeping with a bunch of people. Now, if you make the decision to go do it, that's fine. Do porn. Make your money. Bridget B., she's super successful. Made a bunch of money afterwards. There's a bunch of girls like this uh, that have made a bunch of money after, after doing porn. Congrats. Jess, uh, uh, Lisa Ann. Lisa Ann has a podcast. Podcast super popular. Go get it. But she also knows... It's going to be hard for her to get a traditional dude to want to settle down with her. Totally. Both things can be true. Yeah. And she's not being discriminated by men. She's being discriminated by men as much as I'm being discriminated by the NBA because they won't let me fucking play power forward. I'm not 6'10". I can't play power forward. I don't get to sue them. That's the whole point, man. That's the part that, that I have such an issue with is that that whole thing had happened and it was, it was just like they have a problem with it. But what's so interesting to me is here's what I thought was going to happen. And I was wrong because you said nobody came back to you from the industry. What I thought was initially you were going to get some girls that were upset. And then you were going to become the Michelin star of porn. Do you understand what I'm saying? <laughs> like girls were going to specifically want to work with you to get the five-star rating. Uh, Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very yeah. similar to what happened with Bulzarian, where, where girls literally knew they were hot because Bulzarian let them come to the house or be on his IG. I thought that's what was going to happen. Right. I thought that if you had continued with that, that that's essentially what uh, would happen. I, my, my thought, was, my anticipation was like, okay, here's what's going to happen. All these girls are going to come, come, come out and say like, I was... I was trash. Yeah, on. for sure. Like I, that was what I was anticipating. I'm like, yeah. but by that point, by the time I did the, did the video, I was like, my team was like egging me on to do it. Like we had yeah. the idea. My team was like, do it, do it, do it. I'm like, ah, I mean, the, a bunch of these girls already hate me. So what, what's the worst thing that could possibly happen? I would, I would bet if we went to AVN, a bunch of those girls don't hate you. Oh, uh, I mean, I went to, oh, I went to XBiz like last year in Miami and yeah. I got, I got some nasty. To look really? At. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not. Not very well. Like, listen, if you don't, hey, listen, if you don't like Sterling, come on and, and let's talk about. It. By the way, also <laughs> let me tell you something else. If you if you have a problem with what I said or what what Sterling said about let's wait for the evidence to come out with Andrew Tate, hit me up. Let's have a debate. Like I'm, I would love to. Ha I have socialists come on here. I have uh, hardcore communists come on here. Uh, shout out to TC Fleming, my man. He's a socialist. I love the dude. Uh, I have feminists. I have a girl writing a book on feminism. She's coming on here. I want to hear what you have to say. Because light is a disinfectant, like you said before. There is never, I'm never going to want to have you cancel. You can call me all kinds of names. By the way, shout out to fuckmichaelsartain.com. It just came out the other day. The, all the people who made that uh, website, thank you very much. Uh, There's an entire website? Called yeah, it's called Fuck Michael Sartain. Sartain. <laughs> this is like blogs that are on there. Uh, shout out to all you guys. But, but, the, uh, but the, the, the thing I'm, tr I'm trying to say is, like, I'm never going, I'm, I'm, I'm going to want to debate them. Let's get them on. Let's get more people on. When I saw Brittany Renner ne next to Andrew Tate, I was like, oh, fuck yes. Let's go, bro. It was awesome. Um, so yeah, that was interesting. I thought there was going to be more to it than that. I'm curious. Yeah. What did you think? Uh, did you watch the thing between, uh, Brittany Renner and, and Andrew Tate? Yeah. What on, on just Pearl? Yeah. Just yeah, Pearl. Yeah, you watch it. Shout, shout out to Pearl. Pearl. I'm going to try to do something with Pearl here pretty soon. She's lovely. Um, the thing is about it. One thing that made what sounded like nails scratching on a chalkboard to me is when at the very end of the interview, not the debate when, when, um, actually no, she may have said this twice is when Brittany Renner said, I feel like I have an important voice in this space. And I was just like, oh God, man, your voice is important. And I was just thinking, man, I do a podcast every once in a while on the NFL, but they don't need my voice. They'd be just fine without me. I, I have quantum, mechanic, quantum physicists on here sometimes. We talk about quantum physics. Quantum physics will be just fine. They got Michio Kaku. They're good. They don't need me. They don't need my voice in this space. I'm just what the fuck do you think Brittany Renner was talking about that we need her voice in this space? I mean, She's sitting there doing videos talking about she has a yeast infection from fucking three dudes at the same time. Even porn stars would be like, that's gross, bitch. That's gross. <laughs> you fuck three dudes raw at the same, on the same day in college? That's gross. And, and she's sitting there doing that, and then she wants to express it. And then they asked her later, like, do you regret making those, making those videos? No. No, you don't regret it, but your voice is important? Tell me about why your voice is important. It's 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 this kind of delusional narcissism that people have these days. I think due to like social media exposure. Yeah, like you just get 
a little bit of attention on on yeah. any platform, and all of a sudden people have just these delusions of grandeur. Like, yeah, I I, have, I, I am com uh, completely aware that I am not significant in the universe. Me, yeah, like uh, whoopty whoopty friggin' exactly I'm some same. I'm some dude who teaches dudes how to how to keep the dick hard. Yeah, whatever. Like, okay, cool. I'm helping guys out. Great. But it's like, th if I disappeared, the world would keep spinning. You know, I don't think I'm that important, really, in the grand scheme of things. And so it, it's, yeah, it's. I think it's a symptom of like social media addiction. Like people, people get that little yeah. that drip feed of attention, and all of a sudden they get a, a giant ego about it, and they think they're they're a lot more. So this than happens to are. men and women. I know we always like to point out the delusional women. This happens to men too. Totally. If you ever see guys who were famous in the '90s, right. when I would see them at the Playboy Mansion, they thought that that all the women were still going to want to sleep with them, and it was crazy, bro. These guys had no game at all, totally uncalibrated. So it does happen. Like my experience in high school was not like LeBron James, where he was corded around he had a hummer he had, he was signing shoe deals when he was 18 years old that wasn't that wasn't my experience so his experience would be different if you ever hang out with bulzarian his life is very different than ours we like you and i can go to the store he can't go to the store he can't do his life is his experience but the bubble he lives in is very ex different th than ours with these girls what i think has happened is you and me wake up every day and we see a bugatti and we're like okay i want that bugatti oh i can't afford it the world told me no and then i was like oh that girl is fine man i want to go out with that girl no she's not interested in me the world told me no Oh, let's put 475 on the bench press. I can't lift that much weight. The world told me no. Okay, let me go in this thing. Look at this guy. Let me, let me go talk to this girl. Male stripper, fucking uh, six foot five, jacked bartender. She picks them before me. The world told me no. As men, the world is constantly telling us no. The world is the weight literally that we are deadlifting every day to get stronger. Because the world keeps telling us no over and over again, every day tells us no, we know exactly where we belong. We are not delusional to what our value is. I know exactly how much money I'm worth. I know exactly who is probably going to come on my podcast. I know exactly if I died, my friends would be sad for a week and they'd go on and keep playing video games the next week. They wouldn't give a shit. I know full well exactly what's going on. My girl would move on. Everybody would be fine eventually. I'm fully aware, just like you said. The world will keep spinning. I think as women, though, they go on there and, and they, they, they do these things and everyone tells them yes. The world never tells them no. They walk up to a nightclub. There's 500 people in line. Come on in, honey. Come on in. We get you a free table. It's not a big deal. They sit there. They, they, oh, my God. He's my favorite celebrity. He's so hot. They message their celebrity on IG. He messaged back. Hey, where are you at? What are you doing? The world never tells them no. They see a yacht. They, dude, I've seen girls before do this in Jamaica and Miami. They see a yacht. There's some dudes on the yacht. They don't know, even know who has the fucking yacht, bro. They just walk on. Monaco, all the time this happens in Monaco. Fine women just walk on yachts. They don't even know who owns the yacht. You want to know why? Because nobody tells them no, ever. Nobody tells them no. One of the reasons why Bulzarian was so powerful is because it's so hard to get in his parties. You have to be so fine to get into those parties. They're very strict because somebody, this is the first time a girl told them no. Now everybody wants to try to go there. So I think that's one of the issues why. The world, keep put, the world is this weight that keeps pushing down on guys like you and me to, so we know exactly what our worth is. Keeps us in check. Yeah, definitely keeps us in check. Um, Justin Waller has a question for you. Oh, His question Justin. is, why is Justin the coolest cowboy on the planet? That's what Justin <laughs> Waller's question is for you. I love you, Justin. <laughs> why is he the coolest cowboy on the planet? Yeah. Oh, God, because he's got that, that god-awful Louisiana accent. That's why. You don't like that He's accent? not even a cowboy. He's from Louisiana. Cowboy, Justin, you know for a fact cowboys are not actually from Louisiana. No, cowboys so, are from Texas. No, you can have some cowboys. So cowboy, you can have cowboys in Montana. Cowboys just means you're a wrangler. Like means that you steer uh, bulls and heifers and cows. That's all it means. Are there, cow are there cows in Louisiana? Yeah, the cows. are all like swamp, sure. swamp people sure and, cows. and, and there's, gators. There's, there, there's some cows. Can, there's you, a few. can you be an alligator cowboy? No, can but you, you wrangle. You, no, but you you can wrangle. You can wrangle gators, and you can raise gators. But as far as a cowboy, you're specifically dealing with bovine. Huh. Yeah. So, but I don't know that he ever did that. I, th I don't, I'm not sure that he did it. But that <laughs> cowboy is just a vernacular term. I just like I'm you just guys say. You say I say Gordy right in Australia. Yeah. Like right. This not Gordy. Is, is it Gordy? No, you say no. Gordy's in uh, Newcastle. You guys say Bogan. That's yeah, Bogan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bogan. Bogan's exactly. Yeah. Exactly. My bad. Gordy's shout out to people in Newcastle. That's the wrong word. All right. Um, so, yeah, that's what he wanted to know. Uh, Rolo uh, wants to know, Rolo Tomasi has a question for you. He want, wants, wants to know what w prompted your decision to travel so much recently. You spent a lot of time outside the U.S. traveling around. Uh, looking at different options, really, like different options for setting up businesses, setting up residencies, setting up bank accounts, potentially buying property, potentially buying like land and stuff like that. That's kind of that's what really prompted me to bounce around yeah. so much as last year. Yeah, just investments. Yeah, yeah like, and, and like I'm thinking like five, ten years down the line, mm. like where do, like my my ultimate plan is actually to like have a homestead and like raise cows and chickens and drink raw milk and have really yeah le legit yeah that's, Damn. that's my plan yeah 
I want, I, you know, I want like my my lovely wife to just milk the cow in the morning and bro, <laughs> that's, that's what crazy. I want. That's what I want, you know. That's crazy. Yeah. I, I don't ever want to leave the strip. <laughs> it's crazy. I feel so immature <laughs> sitting next to you. I'm such an immature man. I think I, I've had a d large degree of immaturity. I, I've had enough immaturity in my you life. You get used to it. You know what? I don't yeah. like traveling anymore. You want to know why? I was an Air Force officer. Right. I went around the world like several times. I don't. I want to stay in Vegas. I don't ever want to travel. Yeah, I mean, I, like I've traveled a lot, yeah. especially this last year, and I'm kind of like. I'm sick of living out of a suitcase. Man. Yeah. I'm like, my plan for this next year is just, I want to stay in one city for like eight months. Buy a little, ranch up, buy a little ranch up here in Mesquite, just north of Vegas. You go, or, or Pahrump, you know, uh, Justin Waller, he's building some stuff, some buildings up in Pahrump. Oh, nice. But get you a little ranch out there, live off the milk, the cow milk or whatever, come uh, down to Vegas. And everybody comes and visits you. It comes you down here to McCarran's, and, and yes, I still call it McCarran. Uh, that comes down here and visits you. Um, can we talk about your website? We haven't even, or your YouTube channel. We barely even talked about this. So your intent was that, actually, let's, let's back up. I want to know where, at what point were you red pilled and then what point you decided to make the content you make on your YouTube channel. Right, right. Um, so I guess Rollo Tomasi was the one who kind of who red pilled me because I like, I started, I had a friend of mine actually introduce me to his books and I started reading his stuff. You know what year that was? Oh, it was just it was my first year of porn, actually. It was during my first year. So 2017. Year. Yeah, like 2017. Okay. Yeah. Ish. yeah. I think yeah. I, I think I read it the year it came out in 2013. I think I read the first right, one. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I, I that was you know that was my first introduction to that kind of stuff, and then it was but I I didn't really get like mega mega red. It was kind of like a perfect storm of stuff like reading Rollo stuff plus listening to do like dudes like uh, um, Milo Yiannopoulos and Stephen Crowder. Oddly enough, around, around like 2016 when Trump got elected, mm. like there was just this really interesting thing going on, on the internet at that time. Like all these people telling yeah, me, for sure. like giving me opinion, like giving me like views on things that I'd never heard before. Mm. I found them very interesting and that just led me down this rabbit hole. And I guess, so I guess that's where it started. And the reason, the thing that got me to start doing my YouTube channel and all that was uh, was was really guy, like guys like Rollo Tomasi, uh, John from Modern Life Dating. Uh, a bunch of the Rule Zero guys, they had me on their shows early on. Oh, wait, shout out to Rule Zero. Can you guys please stop doing this at 8 o'clock in the morning so I can come on? I don't understand. <laughs> 8 o'clock in the morning? I thought we were teaching guys to be players. How are they going to be players when they have to get up at 8 o'clock in the fucking morning? On a Saturday. On a Saturday. <laughs> bro, I was out. How am I supposed to? Rollo's like, do you want to come on Rule Zero? I was like, bro, 8 o'clock in the morning? He goes, 8.30. I was like, get the fuck out of here, 8.30? I was like, I'll, I'll stay up all night and come on. 8 o'clock in the morning. Anyway, go ahead. <laughs> But that, yeah, have going on those their shows, and I had, they sort of encouraged me to start my own my own YouTube channel and stuff like that. And it turned out to be a really good way of like reaching more dudes, really, because it was I was when when I was doing porn, occasionally, occasionally I'd get you know DMs on my Twitter and my Instagram from from fans and be like, "Yo, dude, how do I how do you last so long? Or you know, uh, I'm I'm busting so early. Like, how do I fix this? Whatever." And I, you know, I'd, I'd help dudes out here and there, and then it just, I just sort of, sort of seen that more and more. And I'm, I'm relatively articulate, so I was able to kind of like teach. And I'm a good teacher. I used to actually be, a, a, used to be a lab tech. Back oh, in, you have uh, a background in chemistry. We didn't even talk yeah, about that. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. So I've got a, like a kind of a teaching, not a, like a, like a high school teacher teaching background, mm, but yeah. I have been a teacher of sorts before. Okay. So I know how to communicate ideas to people and, and help them. So I sort of just combined these skill sets and found a, a, a very interesting little niche that no one else was really filling and I felt qualified to teach it given my experience. It's the confluence of red pill and then sort of like male intersexual dynamics and the fact that you had experience as, as a, an adult actor. Like yeah. for me, for me, because I was a former U.S. military officer, I teach a leadership course. Right. It's the same situation with you because you did, did, did adult work. You could talk about this specific part because one thing Red Pill does well is theory. One re thing Red Pill does not do well is go out and actually meet fucking girls and have sex with them. That's, that's a completely yeah, yeah. different situation. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's not like, so my, ex my experience was, was a, is unique and the fact that, okay, I did, I did pornography. I also used to work as a high-class male companion. Yes. I also was in the swingers scene. And I also was in the whole pickup scene as well. Yeah. So like, I've my. I've, Hold on, what were you doing in the pickup scene? Back in back in Perth, man, just like hitting up bars. in 2017. Just before five that, five years before that. Okay, so like 2012. Yeah, 2012. Like I was still working for Mystery back then. Oh, no, good. 2010. I was working for Mystery. Just vaguely, I was working for Mystery. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. yeah. I ended up. I was at the time. I was. I was bouncing through clubs with some dudes who would end up working for RSD later on. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Which way? Which guys? Sam. Uh, I don't know. Uh, Ryan Evans. You know Ryan Evans? Oh no, I don't know Ryan. Yeah. I hope it didn't just dock somebody. No. Uh, but any, I don't, maybe it's probably not. It's, it's, people wouldn't be able to find him anyway. But yeah, it was. It, but that 
multiple different kind of layers of difficulty in like when it comes to sexual performance is what I'm able to pull yeah. my knowledge from. So it's, it's not just the pornography stuff because that is like I mean you really can't get a more challenging scenario for the penis than a room full of dudes with like cameras and lights and who, whose entire paycheck depends upon you getting a bro let, let me tell you about it oh wait no let me not tell you about it. go ahead you tell <laughs> you talk about it never mind never mind shut the fuck up never mind but, dude like that's that's it like if you okay if you can get a boner in that scenario okay you, you can you can probably get a boner anyway yeah. like, so if a guy comes to me and he's like yo bro i'm a bit like first time i had sex with this new girl i was a bit nervous what do i do I'm like I've got you. Don't worry. Yeah. We can fix this. No problem. So it's, yeah, it's, you know, and then obviously swinging and stuff and, and escorting. It's like, okay, I got to know the swinging stuff. Layers. Cause this is completely different. The swinging stuff. Like, totally so different. you're, it, you're the unicorn. You're getting invited in with the swinging. Yeah. I'm, like, I'm, where, do you, did I'm, you go, do you go to hedonism? Like, would you go to green door? Where, where do you go to the, this is the back swing? in Australia. Okay. Yeah. So it was very, I mean, this is, I'm fascinated. We, we've had girls come on here talk about swinging and it's just like crazy. Some of the stuff that they talk about, like right. I've always been, this is the one thing I've always been interested in a group. Let's say four couples come in together, four guys, four girls. Okay. The girls don't have to be that attractive. Dudes are just like, eh, whatever. I'm going to do this again. If I have a girlfriend and she brings a girl home that I don't find that attractive, she brought her home. I'm going to have sex with her because my girlfriend asked me to, cause I'm, I'm that kind of guy. Right. Mm -hmm. I, it's for sure. Women are not the same though, though. And I've heard these stories, like just imagine four guys, four girls come in, do this orgy, but one of the dudes, none of the girls want to have sex with. And I, and I asked the girls this and they were both like, yeah, that happens. Yeah. There's some guy, it's like, dude, what the fuck? Could you imagine bringing your girl to a, a, a swingers club and you're watching three other dudes bang your girl and nobody wants to have sex with you? <laughs> No, 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 no. Anyway, go ahead. That, Have you seen that, that experience? That's reality telling yeah. you no. Yeah. <laughs> right yeah. there. Yeah, you see that? I, got my, I was like, I'm like the bull, as yeah. you would call it, right? So I would, I would get invited to, to parties and stuff. By a, so like a, uni, a unicorn, yeah. so a single girl would get invited to a party and I'd be her plus one. Okay. Right, so that's how I'd get into parties and stuff. And I sort of, you know, made my way around the, the local scene, you would say, but... Yeah, you'd go to like big house parties and you'd see some dudes would just get no action whatsoever. And like for me, for me, the, you go the, talk to him. I would go talk to him. Dude, one, one time, one time, dude, one time in Jamaica, I saw this. I saw this guy and his wife was about to get like four weighed. And I'm sitting there talking to the guy and I'm like, hey, man, maybe you want to make some different decisions. Like I was sitting there talking to this girl and I, I actually left her alone because I felt so bad for this dude. I was like, man, why are you doing this? He's like, yeah, I buy her purses and all. He was super good looking too. I was like, I pay for everything in her life. And I'm like, Man, I just I wanted to hug the guy. I was like, bro, we had clothes on. Let me just say, we had clothes on. I was like, man, I feel so bad for you. Shout out to Tom. Tom, you know who you are. Uh, yeah, and I was just like, man, this dude was like, I, and I was watching this girl, and she was just trying to make him jealous, and he's like trying to get a make out with one girl. You know what I'm saying? I'm like, man, this is not for you, bro. Yeah, it's, it's like, life ain't fair, man. And it's, <laughs> it's, it's really- You understand what I'm saying? The woman yeah. could be a six, gets all of them. Totally. The dude could get, the dude's gotta be like an eight and have six pack abs or most of the girls aren't gonna wanna have sex with him. Oh yeah, like I, I was in, like, at that, I was in really, really good shape back yeah. then. It's like mid twenties and stuff. Yeah. So I was like rocking a, a kicking six pack. Yeah. And it's just like, I'd walk into a party and you know, dudes, wives would be throwing themselves at me. Yeah. And he's gotta sit there in the corner and watch oh, man. Like, that kind bro. of stuff. Bro. Oh my God! I did. What does that? You have a problem with that? I've been asked on a few occasions to do uh, that, I just, and I can't. I, I just don't want to watch you in the corner masturbating, bro. While I'm having yeah, sex, just, you just block him out. You block him out. Block Is that out. what you do? Just block him out, man. Like, I, like as long as it's, it's okay. It's a bit harder if he's like given like color commentary. From oh, him. bro, it's a bit different. <laughs> it's a bit harder oh, to, to block him out that way. Like, God <laughs> damn, bro! <laughs> you just you just gotta cut it. Like, and that's you know, honestly, God, that's that's kind of how I knew I could do porn was my first ever time at a swingers party. That would be exactly how I would know I could not do porn. Right. <laughs> exactly that same reason, boy. <laughs> but for me, it was like, first party I went to, right, I was super, super nervous to even go to this thing. Yeah. I almost didn't go. And I, I walked in the door, I was like, still a bit nervous. Started, you know, mingling, chatting to people. And then probably within like 10 minutes, I was completely naked, walking around this party with a raging boner, like just talking to people. With yeah. People with like a drink in my hand. And I was like, huh. I took, like, I took, or yeah. reflected for a second, like, oh, this is, this is my place. You felt good. You felt comfortable. I, I'm there. meant to be here. Yeah. Like I'm. I'm. A, obviously, I'm a pervert, but I'm also like an exhibitionist. Sure. So I'm like, oh, I don't. Mind, I. I like being the center of attention. Okay. Like, and I put. On, I would like put on a show for like the entire party with like a girl or two. Yeah. And make like I wanted to put on such an energetic performance that everyone would watch, and so I. I would. I'd realize like, oh, okay, yeah, like I'm meant to be doing this. Like, yeah. As in, I can do this because yeah. that's kind of in me. 
Okay, so now, speaking of which, I, I wasn't going to ask you this before, but I got to ask now. You did mention in a different interview how it was like devil's threesome. Oh, like uh, okay, so double as teaming a, a wife. I've never, women. I've never done several women. De, d, another, no dudes are in the room with me. I've never done that. How do you, as a heterosexual man, how do you deal? How do you do that? Take the opposite end. You take, take that, but I mean, do you? <laughs> is there a trick? Is you avoid eye contact? And is it like there's no high fives? Like they yeah, do? I mean. <sighs> Was, or am I just being insecure? No, like, no. There was, there, was, there was one. There was one uh, couple that I used to swing with a bunch of times. Like, he was just this. Like, he was a bogan kind of. Like, yeah. Just super like ladsy bogan. Like, yeah. So he was he was just fucking hilarious. So we'd always like high five and make jokes and stuff. Oh my god. So bro. that was actually like, that was interesting. <laughs> that was unique. Fuck. But his, and his wife was like an absolute freaking nymphomaniac. Yeah. She was insane. But for the yeah for the most part you kind of just don't like it's weird. Is it not preferable, and do they have to pay you more? That's what I'm asking. Oh, is in like for the escorting side? Yeah, uh, they have to pay more. Yeah. They have to pay you more with yeah. the other dude in there. Got yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A couple, a couple booking is way more than yeah. like a, just an individual woman. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, totally. But what one of the things I found when when going to swing as a place and stuff as like a single dude, the way that I could get access to the girls was to be very, very polite and complimentary to the dude. Dude, yes. So I'd go, I, I figured that out real quick. I'd be like, Table. okay, this guy's missus is super hot. So I'm going to walk up to the couple and I'm like, I'll talk to him first. I'll be like, man, your, your, your wife is gorgeous. She's like, you're a lucky dude. Like, blah, blah, whatever. Like, just, you know, talk him up. Talk him up. And if this, within five minutes, if this guy likes me, then I'm going to be fucking her. Like, he's going to be like, Yo, yo, meet my wife. Blah, blah, blah. It was layup every time. It was so easy. Hey, listen, your wife is very pretty. Don't uh, pay no attention to my raging boner. Just let's. <laughs> I don't, oh, that's crazy. I have the pants on. Let's look, let's look. <laughs> but we both look down like this over and over again. We're shaking hands. Is that your wife? She is fine, bro. Your wife is fine, bro. <laughs> oh God, man. Oh man. I, I, I listen. I'm not. I wish I was more open minded. I'm not. Like I totally understand when dudes do this, but it was just like. Because uh, the devil's threesome thing, I just couldn't do it. And I know so many dudes who've done that. So especially when I was in high school, these guys would tell me this. I'm like, really? With other dudes? Because that's the thing. Hold on. The Selena, what's her name? Selena Powell? Is that her name? Who's the girl who talked oh. about I suck seven dicks? Was it Selena? I think it was Selena Powell. Like. Yeah, Selena Powell. When she goes out there, I would just want you to imagine, right? Uh, you don't, do you watch NBA basketball? Yeah. Okay. Uh, De Devin Booker sitting next to Dario Saric. You know what I'm saying? Like They're all sitting there with their penises out. <laughs> heterosexual NBA players who were sweaty because they just got through with a game. Because she said this happened after Dre's. Because right. this was this was like a preseason pre game. They all have their dicks out waiting for her to suck each and individual oh, dick. Going down the line. As th these are multi-millionaire men waiting to get their penis sucked by a girl who's getting railed from behind by another dude. I am. This is so alien to my re reality. And it makes me look at Devin Booker very differently. <laughs> Because they said he was one of the dudes that was involved. It was like, because we know it was the Phoenix Suns. But I'm uh, just like, maybe, like, I don't mean to slander Devin Booker. Maybe it wasn't him. But, but, but my point is, I just can't imagine being in a room with seven dudes. And I've been to Jamaica. And I was just like, it's so crazy to me. It's like, what do we talk about, bro? Do we talk about our, our fantasy football lineups while we're waiting to get blown? There's seven of us with our penises out. Bro, it just you, seems crazy. You actually do, like, in those scenarios, because I've had those scenarios, obviously. No, if you're getting paid for a scene, that's different. Yeah. I'm just talking about you're just hanging out with your homies, and you are NBA players. The NBA minimum is $700,000 a year, pimp. And you, are, <laughs> and you are sitting there with six other dudes with your dick out, waiting for <laughs> Selena Powell and all her fucking tattoos and weirdness about to give you a blowjob. And you, this is weird. This is normal. Bro, I'm not gonna have a triple double next game. I don't want to look at you, bro. I want to, I want DeAndre Ayton to take his ass away from me. I don't want to be near his big ass. Are you kidding me, bro? bro anyway, so I'm, maybe I'm just weird. But do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, I get what you're saying. But it, you you, you kind of just block that out. You block out the awkwardness of the scenario, and you just you do you literally just crack jokes and stuff the whole time. And that's that's what it was always like on like set. When yeah, it was like a it was like a gang a blow bang set or something yeah. like that. I remember one of the funniest scenes I did. It was uh, it was an Evil Angel shoot, and it was like. Five dudes, it was a, a blow bang, so that means like one chick and like a bunch of dudes, and it's only blowjobs. Yep. Right? And it's, and it's actually the director's wife is the one we're banging. What? So the director's doing all the filming and stuff, and he's trying out this new assistant, brand new guy. And he's just getting, he's losing his shit at this assistant all day. He keeps fucking up. He's like, the lighting's wrong, this is wrong, that's wrong. It's like, for fuck's sake, Steven, he's just getting pissed all day. And it gets to like this, this final shot, and it's this long couch, and it's like, Dude, 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 me, and then the director is supposed to get right next to me. And he's an older gentleman, right? So he's got one of those like triangular comfort pillows yeah. for his back. 
And he puts that there on the seat next to me because that's where he's going to sit. And his wife is making her way down, knob one, knob two, knob three. This is in Australia. This is, this is in America. Okay, so in right? America, yeah. Gets to me and he's still, <laughs> he's so pissed off. Does the girl who's doing this, she has a podcast now. No. I'm just kidding. No. I'm fucking with you. I'm fucking with you. I'm fucking with you. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm kidding. Almost gave me a heart attack. Yeah. <laughs> but he's so angry at his new assistant. He's sitting in the kitchen. He can't get a, he can't get a boner because yeah. he's so annoyed. He's, just, he's basically he's sitting there furiously. Wait, trying, the assistant's supposed to be part of this. No, the assistant's filming. Okay. And the director is supposed to be the one sitting next to me. Yeah. But he's, he can't get a heart on because he's so angry. So he's sitting there furiously masturbating with a floppy penis, getting super angry at this assistant because he's, he's fucking up the lining or whatever. And he gets the, I can see it, I can see what's about to happen because this sex wedge pillow thing is sitting next to me and the, the new guy has, the uh, new camera guy, he's just turned the camera and it's, I don't, I'm getting my knob sucked by this guy's wife and that's in the shot now. Director's in the court, in the fucking kitchen, loses his ab, his fucking mind. Comes storming out of the kitchen with his thing flopping around. <laughs> For God's sake, Stephen grabs this triangular pillow, just hurls it across the fucking room. And I'm sitting there with my penis in his wife's mouth, and I'm just looking across at the, at the other dudes oh. on the couch. And I'm, I'm trying not to laugh. I'm just like, <clears throat> like trying to keep a straight face this entire time while he's losing his mind. That is that is my experience of like that scenario. Man. We are not monetizing this for, for <laughs> shit. You should, do you, you have a problem talk, with that? You no, I don't care. Do you have a problem with monetization on YouTube? Oh, with, with none stories? of my videos are monetized. Really? No. Oh, all of mine are. And we say none. some crazy stuff. Really? None Why? Because you're afraid to get a strike? Uh, no, we try. We try. Yeah. But they just don't, they, they, it's all, it ends up yellow. You get, oh, you get yellow. Yeah. Well, you still get some money for the yeah. yellow. Not a lot. Yeah. Okay, got it. Yeah, yeah. Just because yeah, we're sure. just going to talk about sex, really. Really? Yeah. I like the, the, the R word. We're taking that out for this one. Yeah. yeah right, right. Um, so um, let me see here. So a couple of the things I want to talk about. So you have a background in chemistry. You, got, you just got a degree in chemistry. You never yeah, did anything with that? Yeah. I, 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 I was a research chemist for a while, did like, a, like pharmaceutical research stuff, and then I did like a industrial like oil and gas quality control testing mm. stuff. Yeah. Really quickly, like did my degree. Did, a th- did like an honors thesis, got out, worked in that for like two years, and I was like, this is not the job for me. What's the only element that can have four covalent bonds at the same time? Oh, God, carbon. There you go. Good job. <laughs> Damn, you're, we, test- we you're do testing a, me. We do a different type of podcast on here sometimes, yes. All right, uh, there's another one I thought was interesting, it was going back to chemistry. Uh, the idea of cholesterol, testosterone, low testosterone, high testosterone, what are your views on that, and TRT for that matter? Yeah. Dudes need to eat more. Need to eat more cholesterol. Yeah, like fat and cholesterol has been like demonized. Mm-hmm. Like you know the whole like food pyramids completely ass backwards. Like the American dietary standards are horrible. Basically, do, people dudes need to eat a lot more like cholesterol, like eggs, hey, hey, egg you, yolks. So, so just for you guys who don't know this, if you can got if you can find one, it's going to be hard to find one. In the 1980s, there was a food pyramid that was put up in elementary schools in the United States. That if you saw this today, would be laughed at and pulled down in two seconds. They told you to eat so much meat and drink so much milk, and at the very bottom of it, and eat and, and so many eggs. At the very bottom of it, it says United Dairy Farmers Association. Right. It was propaganda to get American kids to get used to eating as much bread, drinking as much milk, and eating as much meat as possible in order to, so that they could continue to, co- to consume and keep some of the prices up. That's essentially what was going on. It had nothing to do with people's health. Yeah. Nothing. Anyway, go ahead. Yeah. But for, for those of you who don't know, like cholesterol is, is literally the chemical building block of yes, testosterone, sure. right? Yeah. So you, your body can't make testosterone unless it has, I mean, your body will naturally produce some cholesterol itself, yes, yeah. but you also need a bit of dietary cholesterol sure. as well. And, you know, it, like for me, like I'll, I'd, I'd slam like four raw eggs like the night before a scene every time. Like for, that was my like go-to like kind of boner shake whenever I wanted mm. to, be, to be ready the next day with like a high jacked tea levels. And so, yeah, I think guys need to eat a lot more red meat. Guys need to eat a lot more like, like, like you know, grass-fed meat mm. specifically, like, because there's a massive difference between the quality of, of the fat in grass-fed meat versus pasture, like grain-fed mm. meat. They're like night and day, nutritionally, totally different. Eggs, when it comes to eggs, you want to go for like, again, pasture-raised chickens, ideally, because they're, they're the ones that are walk, they're walking around eating bugs out of the ground. They're not sitting there eating corn, right? And that's, and that's unfortunately a big problem that you have with food here in America is a lot of the, basically the majority of the cows, majority of the chickens, they're all raised on corn. Yes. Like it's all grain-fed. So you don't, that's not what the animal is 
naturally supposed to eat. Yeah, if you want to explore this, guys, the book is called uh, The Omnivore's Dilemma and another book called Sh Sugar, Salt, Fat. They go over this specifically, how the United States basically could create infinite levels of corn and then bu built their entire food structure off corn. Yeah. So you basically, a chicken nugget, for instance, there's no point in a chicken nugget. A chicken nugget was created because these food companies were like, we have all this extra chicken, so what if we take chicken and then batter chicken in uh, chicken emulsify, or no, feed corn to chicken and then take the chicken parts and then batter the chicken in corn, the corn-fed chicken in corn batter, and then feed that to people with salt. Like, that's essentially what happened. It, it, chicken nuggets exist because they're cheap to make. That's why. Yeah, it's really interesting. Uh, uh, and then, as far as testosterone, do you have any opinions on TRT? Oh, TRT, I think, I think it's a, a lot more necessary for a lot of guys. Mm. I think most dudes are unaware of how low their T levels actually are. Yeah. Most guys don't get tested. And Testosterone levels have been plummeting like year on year mm. since like the 1950s. Like, yeah. Like a dude today, like the average T levels of a guy in his 30s today, I think is somewhere around the average T levels of a, of a dude in his 60s in 1950. Something, sure. Something yeah, around that range, right, yeah. right? Like we're literally ha like half as manly as our grandparents, mm. which, which should terrify you. It sh that should really be a concern to most men. Some, to some men it's not. To some men it's, this is the solution. This is the end to violence and toxic masculinity, and that's what they're saying. Yeah, no, yeah, I did. But, but I mean, do you if look around honestly? Do you think that society has genu generally gotten better from in the last? Yeah, from a moralistic years? standpoint, definitely very confusing. Yeah, you know, a lot of mixed signals. You know, uh, you know when that when that's concerned. What I think it is, and I, I've heard you know the conspiracies about stuff they put in the water or whatever, and that might be true. What I think it is is as humans get further and further away from the survival scenario, mm -hmm. the body produces less testosterone because there's a bad side to testosterone. If your key, if your uh, total T is at 900 and you're 65 years old, you're going to have heart problems like right. that. Your body's not re ready for that. So at some p point, there's an evolutionary adaptation for your testosterone levels to go down as you get older. What's happened though is the body is like, okay, does this does this phenotype need the body? Does this uh, phenotype need testosterone? Did it lift anything today? No, it just played video games. <laughs> Did it? Does it need? Uh, does it need the ability to look for women? Does it need energy to go out and meet? Women? No, it just masturbated. Uh, did, did, the, did the body uh, go deal with any kind of survival scenario? Did it oh, go, crash into a bur burning building? Did it confront some criminals? Did it do anything that requires testosterone? No, okay, well, we'll just keep the testosterone levels low. That's what the body's doing. If you were out there baling hay, working on a farm, things like that, fixing cars, I bet you those people would have higher testosterone, oh. just in general. I promise you right now, when I went through survival school, <laughs> they were chasing my ass, trying to kill me, I was, my testosterone levels were probably very high. <laughs> as you get closer to the survival scenario, I think testosterone levels go up, and as you get further, further away from it, they go down. Hmm. I think, I mean, sun exposure is another big factor too. Yeah, sun exposure, right? for we, sure. We, we spend a lot more time indoors now than we used to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But there is there is a lot to be said, though, about, uh, like, the contaminants that we are faced with daily. Like, yes. Like, uh, plastic exposure, phthalate exposure, a lot of this stuff, like, uh, um, estradiol exposure. Mm. Like, we get, we, we're getting bombarded with a little bit of estrogen mimicking compounds. Yeah, Richard Cooper goes heavy into this at the end of his book. Yeah. yeah. Um, my favorite book on this topic is called Esterogeneration. Yes, and I've, I've downloaded it. I haven't read it yet. Rollo told me to read that. It's an yeah. amazing book. Like, if, unfortunately, that book will make you kind of paranoid because mm. about like 99% of the book is like, here's what's wrong. It's terrible. Bam, 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 bam. And the last 1% of the book is like, here's how to fix it. It's terrible. Let's all take trend. Come on, let's go. <laughs> let's anavar it and never give up. Anavar it up. <laughs> I, I've, I've, I've never gone down that road. I've never done like... Any, I've never even actually known anyone personally who's who's used like Tren or, or Decca. Yeah, I've never the, Tren or Decca. That's ha hardcore. Just for right. people who don't know, TRT would be like a two on a, uh, a scale of one to ten. Ten being Jay Cutler uh, at Mr. Olympia taking uh, sixteen or twelve IU's of, of HGH per day on Equipoise and Trembolone and all these. Other, he he wasn't on Trembolone at the time, but he had tried Trembolone previously. That's a ten. We'll call that a ten. Mr. Olympia, we're going to call that a ten. Right. Okay, and then the guy who's you know, 45 years old who's on 100 megs of testosterone, we'll call that a one, okay? In between 10 and one, somebody who's taking like, you know, 200 milligrams of testosterone or whatever, uh, and then taking like a, a, a blocker, I would say that's a two or a three, right. okay? Once you're taking Trembolone, now we're at a six, seven, eight. Uh, Trembolone, Trembolone is like, you, somebody said, we're gonna kill your whole, if you don't put on 30 pounds of muscle in the next six months, we're gonna kill your family, that's when you take Trembolone. Does that make sense? Okay, that makes sense. Like it's life or death. Like I got it. Your hair is gonna fall out. You're gonna have horrible back acne. You're gonna be oily as shit, and you're probably gonna get a fucking assault charge. But you're gonna gain thirty pounds of muscle. That's tremble out. Huh. Got it? Okay. Good. That's good to know. Yeah. 
Um, so anyway, the, this is another thing I really liked you talking about this was the, dear, the difference between fear and anticipation and how women are attracted to men who are bigger and stronger than them. Mm -hmm. And this dichotomy, I bring this up all the time, how men don't realize this. As a man, when I go out to a club, if a woman gropes me, I don't call security. I don't call the police. Oh, you grabbed my penis. Oh, sorry. Oh, thank you. It's, have a nice night. I move on. I'm not going to call the security because a woman grabbed my butt. No, I'm a dude. I tell guys all the time, if a girl grabs your butt, just move on. Say thank you. Just move on. And for women, it's very different because of someone who's bigger and stronger than you groped your private parts. And this insinuates a lot more of a dangerous situation. And an evolutionary adaptation for women is to not be assaulted sexually. That's a big adaptation for them. So can you talk about this whole idea between fear and anticipation when it comes to women? Yeah, I mean, like, think about, <sighs> like, put yourself in a woman's shoes for a second, right? You're, tr you're attracted to something that can kill you. Yeah. That's interesting, isn't it? Like, it, that'd be like, uh, like, it's like me being attracted to a, a grizzly bear. Or something like that. It's like, yeah. this thing can take my life away, but you want to mate with it. Mm. You know, so that's, that's, that's the foundation of, you know, the dynamic. So it's kind of weird that in that, when you think of it that way. But, f like, fear and anticipation are like two sides of the same coin, kind of, right? So, like, one is, like, you're expecting an outcome that's negative. That's, that being fear, you're anticipating a negative outcome. And in the, in the, sorry, I'm saying fear and excitement. I yeah. should be saying fear and excitement are two sides of the same coin, right? One is anticipation of a negative outcome. One's anticipation of a positive outcome. Yes. But they're both anticipating some kind of future outcome. And it's like, well, that's what gets women excited in the first place. Like sexual tension is anticipation. It's that exciting part of the unknown of what's coming. Like as a, as a good example of this, whenever we would shoot like, uh, like kink scenes, or like BDSM scenes, for example, we'd have to go through like a literal checklist of like, okay, we can, like I can, she would be like, you can do this to me, this to me, this to me, don't do this, 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 or whatever, right? And you can say these words, you don't want to say these words, right? And nothing is, and this is, for me, this is actually a very, it was a very interesting observation. Nothing will kill sexual tension more than doing a checklist like that. Mm. Because now there's nothing to explore between me and her. We, we, we both know exactly what's going to happen now. So there's no room for imagination in her head. She can't go anywhere in her head. There's no fantasy anymore of like, what is he going to do to me? Is he, like, and because there's a part of that element of, of excitement is the danger and, and the, that, that kind of, that little bit of fear in a way because you're, a man's demonstrating like the capacity for violence, not actual violence. Mm. Like, don't, I'm not saying men need to be violent to women at all. But when a man can demonstrate that he at least has the capacity for violence, a.k.a. through maybe being a bit physically dominant with her in bed, right? Spanking, hair pulling, this kind of stuff. That inherently demonstrates that he has the ability to defend her, ultimately. If he is bigger and stronger and more physically capable than her, okay, well, that means he's probably going to be able to defend her in a life-threatening scenario. Or, like, if a bear attacks or if some other dude comes and tries to, to assault her, he can actually step up and do something about it. Versus if he doesn't have that capacity for violence at all, he is completely useless to her. But that capacity for violence, until she is like certain of like his intent towards her, which is hopefully to protect her, yes. there's that an element of the unknown creates that sexual tension, creates that element of being exciting. Yeah, yeah it's, it is really incredible. Like, and I tell guys this all the time. And, uh, you know, if you go to prison, are you the one who's going to be somebody's bitch? Like, ask yourself, like, look in the mirror, bro. Like, oh, I wonder why she never calls you back. Ask yourself that question. And it's not, it's not just being short either. Yeah. Or being tall. Do it, I tell these guys all the time, I don't want you to go out and start fights. But if you completely look like you have no capacity for violence, that doesn't make you a peaceful man. What makes you a peaceful man is the ability to conduct violence and choosing to not do so. That is attractive. That is also the humans that this planet was built on, construction workers, U.S. military members, and firefighters. Those are the men who are capable of massive amounts of violence, but choose to be peaceful and choose to bring peace to other people. For sure. Agreed. Uh, the other one is, I love this one, so pre-selection is the basis of my whole program, uh, Men of Action. Uh, the idea of status and social proof and pre-selection in order to generate attraction for women. You briefly talked about that in one of your videos. Can you go into that? Yeah, I mean, like, <clears throat> I, uh, I was kind of, shocked when I when I kind of got out of like for the most part got out of shooting pornography for 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 the most part I thought man it's going to be you know kind of difficult for like a regular woman to like accept 
being with, like to want to date me, right? Because it's like, oh, okay, I've got all this this past, this history. I would have thought the same thing, except uh, after my recent experience, I know that that's not the case. It wasn't the case, yeah. And I was like, I was I was actually genuinely stunned the num like how except even the most like, you know, like pastor's daughter, like church loving virgin women, would still find it curious and still be like it wouldn't put them off. It wouldn't knock them off your, the fence. Your body count meant nothing to them. Nothing. If anything, it, it, if anything, it made me more interesting, mm -hmm. right? And that is just a perfect example of how powerful pre-selection really is. Like, no woman wants to, un, un, unfortunate reality, no one wants to date a virgin. No one wants to date a dude who's got less experience than her, generally, you know? If she's got more experience than him, she's probably going to, he's probably going to end up pussy whipped, really. He's probably going to end up being taken advantage of. Mm. And you see a lot of, you actually see a lot of this with girls in the industry who, and who they, they either get out of the industry or during their time in the industry, they're dating a guy who's what we call a civilian, right? A dude who's not in the industry, not a performer. He just gets cucked. And he's probably literally, he's literally getting cucked. Yeah. But he just gets walked all over in the relationship. You know, he's the guy. It's kind of like reverse pimping in a way. Yeah. Because they, they'll take, their boyfriend will be doing like all of like, the editing for all their videos, he'll be running all their socials, he'll be doing all this, 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 this for her, and she'll be out there jumping on some other dude's dick. And she'll come home tired and just cuddle with him. And I'm like, damn. But, yeah, th this idea of, like, uh, going back to the idea of, like, of pre-selection and stuff, I mean, you're a perfect example of it. Dan Bilzerian's a perfect example of it. Andrew and Trista Tate are a fantastic example of it. Dudes who just surround themselves with women become so attractive to any woman that can see them. And and there's no upper limit to it. This is another yeah. part. Women will straight up say that they don't like it and then date guys who are just like that. Yeah. This is why rule number one in MOA is we only pay attention to what people do, not what they say. And you will see that I've seen it over and over again, these women that will, uh, I've said this before, I'm sorry if it's as offensive, women vote with their vagina. They will complain <laughs> about Brock the bartender while saying that Alex the accountant is the sweetest guy in the world. And you'll ask them, you already know the answer, which one did you sleep with? They slept with Brock the bartender. And that, that's the thing. And so they'll, they'll sit there and complain about how he doesn't treat her like a gentleman. He just tries to sleep with her in the middle of the night. And Alex, the accountant, is so nice to her. And he's because Alex, the accountant, is blue pilled. He doesn't know any better. He think he listens to what she says and follows her breadcrumbs down to a, a place of platonic friendship. While meanwhile, uh, Brock, the bartender, he doesn't listen to anything. He's just watching what's happening. Mm. He just knows what his experiences have been with woman after woman after woman, and he knows better than to go down that path. And so that's one of these situations that happen. Meanwhile, this is the, another thing that I think is really funny is how women denigrate porn stars and girls on OnlyFans for what they do. I have a friend of mine, Nara Ford, has been on here, uh, and some other girls who've been with like one guy on their OnlyFans. The, they'll say, oh, had sex with the Uber driver, had sex with the, the, the pizza, delivery, the pizza guy. delivery guy. Had yeah. pet, had sex with you know the neighbor, but it's all the same guy. It's yeah. their boyfriend. They've been with one guy the whole time. They've made hundreds of thousands of dollars a month. And these women who were in a sorority in college, who have been ran through by the entire football team, are saying that the women on OnlyFans are whores. It's crazy to me, like the level of hypocrisy. As you were saying before, like I know girls who've done uh, done OF or done porn, and they've been with four dudes. They've only worked with four guys. That's oh, yeah. it. And you so, know, and that, that's that's funny because you look at, like I said before, the the porn industry in America, right? You look look at a talent pool of like maybe a thousand chicks and act, actively working, like twenty to fifty dudes, like consistently working. Yeah. So like, if a girl got into porn. And she just and she only slept with dudes in porn. She'd probably have a lower body count than the average sorority girl. For sure, dude. You know, and yes. people don't people don't even think that's like they they'll think oh she's a porn star she must have a body count of like hundreds. Okay, she's shot maybe a hundred, couple hundred scenes, yeah. but it's with the same twenty dudes again. Yeah, again. you know. So it's it's it makes it an interesting scenario. But th this idea of like you know women will say they want this guy and they go after a, a different one. Like they they want a dude who has options. Do they want him to exercise those options? No. But no no woman wants a guy that has zero options. It's so crazy how I can tell when a woman's attracted to me because other women are attracted to me and she just on her life will deny it. She'll be like, no, it's because you're good with your mom and I like the fact that you rescue animals. No, it's not. You see other women are attracted to me yeah. and that's why you, and it's so crazy. Like they, they, can't, they, they can't rationalize they it. They can't rationalize yeah. it and they just deny that that's part of the reason why. It's like, no, it's because you're big and strong and fit. Yeah, when other girls think that they're attracted to me because of that. That's exactly why. Mm. It, man, it's, it's so crazy when you see that. But the other thing I've noticed, and you just mentioned this before, is the number of guys that I met that are former bartenders that have a body count five, six, seven hundred women and they marry the girl who's like 
straight, just good girl, been with like two dudes in her whole life. And like, she's married to a guy with a 500 body count because she doesn't care yeah. at all. This is what I go back before with the guys. Status is status is status. There's not good guy status. There's not bad guy status. You will see, like when you see Kylie, when you see the, them dating like Travis Scott or whoever these, these other fucking uh, um, artists are with ta facial tattoos, doing all this crazy stuff, going to jail, and still these celebrity women want to date them. Or when you see the things like Richard Ramirez, remember the Night Stalker, had all these women throwing themselves at him after he'd murdered like 17 people. You need to understand, women do not sleep with you because of your intent. They sleep with you because of your status. And as sick and as horrifying as that is, if you ignore that, you become Alex the Accountant. You listen to everything that Disney and your mom and your church told you, mm. and you end up alone. And when you finally do find a woman to marry you, she will will cheat on you. Let me say this again. She will cheat on you. That's what's going to happen. She's going to replace you because you did not re receive the requisite experience. You didn't have enough experience to understand the difference between what you are told and what is actually the truth. Mm. I think that's growing up as like a blue pill guy. Well, you don't need to sleep with 500 girls. That's not what I, my point was. <laughs> well, my point was that you don't need that. that but there was, I was using an extreme example. Go ahead. Yeah. But Growing up like a blue pill guy and growing up with all these like romantic comedies and like Disney Hallmark movies. Dude, wasn't Hitch the most terrifying movie you've ever seen in your so life? It's so bad. It's yeah. so it's it's so de like deliberately misleading. Yes. And you, right, Fifty and, Shades of Grey. Oh, he's a billionaire with a huge penis, and and he <laughs> waited for you, Anastasia. He didn't fuck anyone else but you. Oh my God, is that what we all want? That's so great. Let's all do this. Let's all women read this. This is super healthy for them. We're all gonna get our billionaire with a giant penis too, and they're never gonna fucking cheat on us. That sounds great. <laughs> I that that book was interesting, right? Because people would will ask like the chicken egg question about that book. Like, was that was that did that book create like a, the a, delusion? No, it was like, like a, a yeah, like a, a or I was going to say like a trend for women to be into like more BDSM stuff, or was that desire already there and that's why the book was popular? I think the book made it more acceptable. I think they were the the, the fantasies were there because of the excitement, uh, fear thing that you were just talking about before. How close they are to one another. Like, yeah, you'll be like you've. You know, I'll just say this now. There are things that women have asked me to do behind closed doors that if you had walked in, you'd call the cops. Yeah. And they're completely consensual, and yeah. they've asked me. To, there are things I will say to a woman behind closed doors I would never say in, out in public. It's horrible things. But in behind closed doors, this is what they want me to do. And so that's the thing. When you see that, you see that how close those two things are, the fear and the excitement. That's the reason why the BDSM. The BDSM thing was always there. Because what it is, it's a sign of fitness from the man. You are physically dominant enough to do this. Yep. And so that, that lets her know, once Genghis Khan shows up, at least we're going to try to fight to keep me from getting... That's essentially what's going on. Yeah. This is, I think this, this is one of the most... One of the biggest like red pills I, I kind of digested early on. And this is going to sound horrible, but... To understand like the nature of the beast you're dealing with, a.k.a. women, right? Understand that they are capable of falling in love with, uh, biologically, I'm not saying this should happen, I'm not saying this is a great thing, but this is, this is biologically they're capable of falling in love with a man who kills her husband mm. and sexually assaults her. Yeah, so... Because, because you look at back, we, yeah, we, there, we there, rewind there, the clock. There's science on this. The yeah. adaptation, women can get over breakups faster than men because they were the ones in the tribe that were left alive yeah. after all the, the military age men's, men were killed. The women had the choice of either dying or accepting a new partner. The women who died did not pass along their genes. The women who accepted the new partner, that adaptation continued to procreate amongst the Genghis Khan and those types of conquerors or Xerxes or whatever. And so when that happened, you started to, to see that, that women have an adaptation to be able to move on from their dead partner onto the next one much quicker than men do. Yeah, and I, I think that's that's a real big red pill for a, yeah, lot, like, for sure. for a lot of guys to kind of internalize that idea that 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 understanding of female nature, that that'll that'll actually put you on a, on a on further down the path, I think, than a lot of other things. Yeah, understanding that. Better. Hey, but but by the way, like, let's think about this: women have, uh, you know, they have uh, unconditional love for their children. If they didn't have unconditional, think about your, your the children are they can't defend themselves when they're young. 
and they come out and they're not able to walk or feed themselves or do anything. And when women first have children, they have this huge oxytocin response that causes them to feel this attachment to the children. These are ev evolutionary adaptations. You know why? Because childbirth sucks. It's very painful. Women would not go through it if it wasn't at the end, there wasn't this prize at the end of having this oxytocin rush for having this child that you'd created. Now, what's the next evolutionary adaptation? I'd be willing to die so that this child lives. If I have unconditional love for this child, who do I not have unconditional love for? my replaceable husband. Why? Because the last husband was replaceable after the last tribe came and killed the last husband. That's the reason why. It doesn't make women bad. I know a lot yeah, of exactly. MGTOW guys think that this makes women bad. It doesn't make women bad. It's the reason there's 8 billion humans on the planet and 400,000 elephants. Because, because we have this adaptation. We have one gender that's out there to protect that is somewhat replaceable and live shorter lives and is bigger and stronger. And the other one that is willing to do anything and everything it can to make sure that the offspring lives. That's it. Yeah. That's, the, that's the way natural selection has created us. It doesn't make one side better or one side worse. That's just the way it is. Tiger, you got stripes, man. Yeah. You know, don't, don't, exactly. hate, don't hate nature for what it is. Exactly. Uh, I love the concept of player versus player for men. Uh, like, it's one concept that women just kind of don't seem to grasp. Mm. Is that, like, for us, when women are like, why are you so shallow? And you're always trying to chase the money and get the muscles and all this kind of stuff. And because a lot of women don't understand. When we don't, someone else does. It's almost like the artificial intelligence race. When people are like, it's... it's it's irresponsible for the United States to continue to research artificial intelligence because artificial intelligence will become dangerous. Well, you know what's more dangerous than American artificial intelligence? Chinese, Chinese artificial intelligence, <laughs> which means we got to get to it before they do. Yeah. It's an arms race. So the same kind of situation with men. It's like, why, why do you go out and get the Lamborghini? Because the, the last guy I'm competing with, that's why. You think, and women don't think that way. They think that, no, he's a Sagittarius. That's why I'm with him. Because it was fucking fate. No, it wasn't fate. Like we have to, men, we have to compete to create these scenarios so that you notice us. If we don't, if we don't, then we become one of the eighty percent of men on Tinder, Bumble, and Hinge that are report that are reported by women to be unattractive. We end up in that unattractive category, and you notice that top twenty percent. Why? Because money muscles game. They're out there doing the competing. They're player versus player. It's not that we have. It's not that we're shallow. We have to do this because of the arena created by women. We are competing. Men compete compete with other men in an arena created by women, and women create. Women compete with other women in an arena created by men. Dr. David Buss said that's one unique thing about Homo sapiens. We're the only species that do that, that does that. The arena of competition is created by the opposite gender. Can you talk about this concept of player versus player? Yeah, I mean, guys, this kind of goes back into the whole like blue pill Disney hallmark kind of upbringing that all of us have that we're kind of brainwashed with. It tries to trick men into thinking that you don't have to compete. Mm which is the most dangerous mentality you could have as a guy, is thinking you can just waltz through life and everything's going to be fine. You're going to win because you're special. Yeah. Baby, she cheated. Mom, 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 talk to your mom. Honey, she cheated on you because she doesn't realize how special you are. She doesn't realize that what a special angel my baby is, and that's the reason why she's in, in, in a Biscayne Bay right now on a fucking 180-foot yacht with some rich sultan right now having a threesome with him. That's why, because she didn't realize how special you were, baby, living in my basement. That's what happened. <laughs> That's where guys end up. They, they, end up, they, end up, they end up bitter at the world. They, we talked about before, okay, like some guys just want to try and tear others down. Well, it's because they, they've lived in this delusional world where they don't think they have to compete and they see a guy who's crushing it. They're like, mm. ah, oh, well, I spent my whole life not building towards that. I have to tear that guy down mm -hmm. now because I didn't make it, you know? And it's... If guys could just wake up, from, like the the sooner the, the the sooner you adopt that mentality, like as a young man, that you have to compete in every field of life, right? You have to not only you got to make money, okay, you got to you got to be build a physical presence, right? You should be fit, like capable of violence in some way, right? Like firearms or, or self defense or whatever, right? You need to be charming and funny and 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 network and have a good social circle and have influence. It's just all these things compound on top of one another. And if you don't at least try in any of these things, you're going to get left behind. And it's, unfor it's unfortunate, but life ain't fair. Life is just... It's, stop thinking that life is supposed to be yeah. magical and you're special and it's all going to work out. Because it ain't. If you just sit around, nothing's going to magically fall into your lap. No, no woman is going to fly across the nightclub and land on your cock. It ain't going to happen. You have to make things happen. And that's that ties into the idea of like you're you're as much as you know, I like like using Justin as an example. As much as I love the guy, like 
there's a reason why we, we, we get along is because we're actually, we're proactively competing with each other. For sure. You know, as friends, we're helping each other, but we're also competing at the same time, you know? That's why, you know, like he, when we're living together in Miami, he brings a girl home. I'm like, son of a bitch. Right? I, I'm, the next night, I'm going to try and bring one home. You know, like it just keeps you on your game every single time, right? Uh, that, that, so competition doesn't have to be a, a bad thing in that regard. Like you can keep it really, really positive like that too. You said porn is to men what Instagram is to women. It's yeah. so great. Like mm -hmm. the idea of women being addicted to attention and men being addicted to unlimited sexual access. Yeah. I think I, I had this, this idea the other day. Like I was trying to think of like what, what are some of the biggest things that have, you know, kind of set society or at least male-female relationships backwards. And I think the three biggest negative influences have been the birth control pill, the mobile, the smartphone and Instagram. Mm. I think those three inventions or whatever have probably screwed up. I mean, like you, some guys, are, like, guys like you are doing fantastic, right? But the average guy is getting compl Agreed, completely yeah. hosed. That's, the, that's the, the show we're doing tomorrow. That is the main point of the show. Right. Yep. But those three inventions, like birth control pill, specifically like the pill, yeah, smartphones and then freaking Instagram, all three of those things have massively skewed the dating marketplace to this 80-20 Pareto kind of distribution. And the really interesting thing about the birth control pill, a lot of people don't realize this either, is it'll cause women to mate select completely differently than when mm -hmm. they're not on the and birth control pill. And when they get pill. off it, they're like, who is this beta cuck that I've married? Yeah. Yes. And then they, and then they get divorced. They get, mm -hmm. they, they get married. They get off the, she gets off the pill to have a kid with the guy. And then she realizes she's not attracted to him anymore. And she divorces his ass. It's like, I, I, I would love to know. I mean, there's probably no way to find this out. But I'd love to know what percentages, what percentage of like divorces are due to a girl getting off birth control. You could, you could say, you could, you could not do a correlation, but you could say, or you could do a correlation, but you could not prove causation. Yeah, yeah. But you and I would know different, right? Just like I would like to see a study of testosterone levels of men in their 50s who committed suicide. Huh. I could not prove cor a correlation, but you and I, but I know the, because I've been, I've had low testosterone and high. I know the difference. I would know what that actually meant. You know, a, a study I always wanted to do when I was in porn was I wanted to do the, the, like a blood panel of all the male porn stars and check out their testosterone levels. But more importantly, I wanted to see their prolactin levels. Mm, for sure. Because people don't re really understand pro how important prolactin is for your sex drive. It's the thing in your brain that causes you to have a high sex, mm. either a high or a low sex drive. Yeah. For guys who don't understand this, when you, so when you ejaculate as a dude, your, your brain dumps this chemical called prolactin. And that is what causes the male refractory period, that time you need between orgasm like you, you, you jizz and you have to give it a few minutes before you can get her up again that's called the refractory period and that is caused by prolactin and some they've done studies on guys who are uh, like naturally multi-orgasmic they can literally go pop stay hard pop again keep going keep going and they do blood tests on them and they don't secrete prolactin wow so there's a massive correlation wow. there between sex drive and pro and the amount of prolactin in your brain wow um, I, I've heard you address this question before, but I want to hear it again. Why? I understand why men do porn. Why do have you found that women do porn? What is the main reason that women get into traditional porn? Yeah, there's, there's a couple. Uh, one one of them, t t like a common theme, tended to be like, for want of a better word, like get revenge, like getting back at someone, getting back at an ex, getting back at daddy, getting back at the church, you know, getting back at some kind of like authority figure. In the past, do you find that a disproportionately high number of girls in porn have problems with their family? Uh, I wouldn't say. Meh, I mean, honestly, I don't really know that. Like the relation, their personal yeah. relationship with their fathers, I don't really know. Yeah, but I just, I do know that a lot of them, you know, came from like Catholics, like Catholic upbringing, Mormon upbringing. Like, Car dude, Car so Carmen, Carmen, uh, uh, Carmen, Karma. Her dad was a preacher. And then she turned yeah. it into like she is the fucking twelve on the on the promiscuity scale. Nobody nobody tops her, dude. There's a bunch of people. Yeah. There's a bunch of examples like that. Yeah. of people who have come from highly religious backgrounds to get into it. I mean, and then the, the other thing is like, especially now, it's a lot more socially acceptable. Like we got the whole the anti slut shaming movement, yeah. whatever massive like. Isn't it funny on the short term for guys? It's like great, you get to have more sex. On the long term, it's like there's no wife left. Yeah, yeah, that is the conundrum, right? Yeah, and it's. You got this this phenomenon now of like passport bros bouncing overseas to try and to try and wife someone. What, up. what is your th thought on the passport bros? Um, I mean, like, like you can technically call me a passport bro in a, in a way, right? Yeah, but you aren't going to other places because the women are easier. Uh, not easier. I'm I'm not, not easier, but I, I, I do go looking for wifey material. In, Interesting. In okay, got, it, got it. So okay. for me, that 
That is a legit passport bro to me. Yeah. The ones that go, oh, yeah, I'm going to Florinopolis to look for a wife. No, you aren't, bitch. You're going, <laughs> no, you aren't. You're going there to have sex with Brazilian prostitutes, bro. <laughs> I'm not stupid. I'm going to Medellin to look for a wife. Shut the fuck up. You ain't finding a wife. No, in you ain't finding a wife. You're going to find some fine-ass women. You ain't going to find a wife. It's hilarious. You know, that, that was actually one of my... Uh, I was let down when I went to Median yeah. by that exact fact. I was like, these women are smoking hot, but they like they all have a kid by 20. Yeah. All of them. Mm. I'm like, damn. <laughs> like, they're getting, they're getting pregnant at like 16. Yeah. Madness. Jesus Christ, it's insane. Nar like narco babies. Lots of that going on. Yeah. What's that going on? Crazy. So you think the girls get into porn because of the revenge, the situation with their father. Yeah, and, and because it's a lot more... Uh, um, Socially acceptable, ex socially acceptable, acceptable. As a, as a, and, and, they, and they think, th the, here's the misconception that they have though, is they think it's e quick and easy money. Yeah. And I mean now, because like, you see all these stories of, of women making like, you know, a million dollars on OnlyFans or whatever, that is, like OnlyFans isn't a, an easy job, like the, it, it is the, work. The average uh, content creator on OnlyFans makes $150 a month. Yes. Because I, and you, a lot of girls on uh, on Twitter will, will put in their bios, like, oh, I'm the top, I'm, I'm in the top X percent of OnlyFans. Yeah. And as someone who has run OnlyFans accounts for girls, I know, like, I can see where you are on the sliding scale. If you post your percentage, I know, rough, I know basically how much money you're making per month. And a whole bunch of them are making like 50 bucks a month. Yeah. And they're bragging about it somehow. Like, they're like, our content creator, I'm like, you, you, you chose this path thinking it was easy money and you've made a that which is a decision you cannot take back the internet is forever you cannot erase this now really and you're doing it all for 50 bucks you know i think a lot of women would be and, and this is an unfortunate thing with with professional porn is a lot of girls don't get any like career advice at all mm. you know that i'm not saying that like, the agents don't don't take advantage of them. i'm not saying that but they just they get no education on how to how to spend their money properly no education on how to like kind of pace their career mm. successfully so they have a long successful career because some women kind of shoot themselves out within like six to 12 months yeah and others can have like a 10-year career i would recommend if you got if, if you're a lady listening to this and you ha are having this issue contact isabella james uh uh spiritual bimbo she she it's all she does she teaches a course tells girls what to do with their money nice. she makes she makes a buku amount of money uh, she's I've, I've, she's multiple investment properties. She's very very smart with this, uh, and she teaches a course on this specifically. I know some other girls that are good at this, but but Isabella actually teaches a class on this. Nice. Yeah. So girls will get caught up in that thing. The other thing you were saying about the revenge, Larry King interviewed Dan Bilzerian one time, and he said, "Don't you feel like you're using all these women?" He goes, "I feel like well, they're using me too. Half these girls are here to get back at someone." Right. Girls who want to get back at their ex, one of the first things they do is go sleep with Dan. It happens often. Now, to me, not quite sleep with me, but they'll go do an interview with me on the red carpet and flirt with me so that their boyfriend will be pissed. That happens all the time. Or even come on the podcast to piss somebody off. I've had girls do that too. So yeah, that whole revenge thing is a real, real thing. Yeah. yeah. A woman scorned. Awesome, man. Uh, can we talk about your course? Yeah. I mean, I've, I've got like, a, I've, I have like four eBooks and a couple of video courses out there right now. But basically, I, I, I cover... I try to cover every kind of problem a dude could have in the bedroom. Mm. So I've got, I have a, a book on how to prevent premature ejaculation. Yeah. I have a book on uh, how to prevent performance anxiety. Real big problem for most guys. I have a video course on, on dirty talk and different ways to use dirty talk and, the, and basically like the importance of dirty talk when it comes to bedroom and in the relationship in general. I have a, a, one of my best courses though is my sexual dominance escalation video course, which talks about this concept we mentioned before of the idea of like, being a more dominant guy in the bedroom and like why that is so attractive and practically demonstrating, you know, the correct way to do some of these more risque things in the bedroom. Like, okay, here's a, there's a correct way to, to choke a woman in the bedroom. There's a correct way to pull someone's hair, mm -hmm. you know? And basically what I, what I try to do is download my brain into my students. So he, he can now go, cause I've literally had dudes who are like virgins or they've had like a body count of like one or two women who will watch this stuff and they'll go and apply it and their girlfriend will think they've got like a lot more experience than yes. they actually do have. And so I'm, I'm able to give these guys an advantage. You're artificially adding to their body count. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Without them sleeping with anyone. Yeah. That's incredible. But the, cause there's no, it's, it's a really honest signal yeah. of pre-selection, like your skill in the bedroom. Cause sex is a learnable skill like anything else, right? Like, like, people aren't, like, born naturally amazing in bed. It's a learnable skill, and it's more important that men learn it. 
Yes. Than women. Because women not, like, if a woman is fine enough yeah. and she's not good and bad, just just do what I say. We're good. Yeah. Like, good, good sex, in my opinion, good sex is determined 100% by the dude. Yeah. You know, like, when women try to be, try to be too, like, good in bed, it, it actually just kind of comes across as, like, masculine. Yeah. Because they're trying to take, take charge and move and, and, you know, lead and do stuff like that. But, I mean, at least in my opinion, like, a, a, a really sexy woman is, is basically just a woman who's enthusiastic. Mm. That's kind of all a woman needs to bring to the bedroom. Just bring enthusiasm yeah. and then let him take care of the rest, let him lead. And that's, again, that's kind of what I try to teach guys is like how the importance of leading in the bedroom, how to have confidence in doing that, because that's another big thing. If you're not confident in what you're doing, let's say you're trying to do something, trying out something new in the bedroom, like, I don't know, like a, a new toy or you're trying to like tie her up for the first time, get into a bit of BDSM, right? If the man isn't confident and comfortable in what he's doing, then she sure as hell isn't going to be comfortable in it. Like, he has to go there first. He has to believe in what he's doing yeah. for her to, to trust him and feel safe in him executing that particular sex act with her. I love it. Hey, man, where can we find you online? Where can we find your course, your website, social media, and your uh, YouTube? Cool. Uh, you go to sterlingcooper.com. That's where you can find absolutely everything. My uh, YouTube, again, just type it uh, on the screen uh, down over here. Type in uh, at Sterling Cooper. You'll find my... YouTube there. My t Twitter is at Sterling Wisdom, and my Instagram is at Cooper Sterling. That's where you'll find me all over the internet. Guys, he's got, he's got interviews with some really, really great people. I, I recommend you guys all check out uh, his channel. There's some real. And by the way, if you have questions about the things that he was asking about, one of the things I really appreciate uh, is that you know some guys who can make it easier to talk about those situations. Because I don't really, I don't really go I hang out with my buddies while we're eating pizza. I'm like, hey man, I'm having trouble with the premature ejaculation. <laughs> But it, why they're eating the fucking uh, they the, they eating the ribs? Hey man, can you tell me about premature ejaculation? But you make it better. You make it a lot easier, man. So I appreciate I appreciate your channel. It's great. Thank you, uh, guys. Take care. Uh, we will see you all next week.